Chapter 1. Ava Honeywood pressed shuffle on her Reba playlist and then turned up her speaker. She checked the clock for the tenth time in ten minutes. It was two minutes till one. He's not going to call, Ava. It's time. She had 100% known this was coming, so why was she so sad? Do not cry, Ava. Nope. She wasn't going to cry. Not one single tear. She was already all cried out. She went to the closet and dug out her old, tattered suitcase, which she laid on the bed before checking the clock one more time. She had told him that she would give him till one o'clock. And she'd known when she said it that he wouldn't believe her. That was part of the problem. He was so confident, cocky even, that she would never leave him. Maybe if he was even a little bit worried about that, he wouldn't keep choosing the rodeo over her. The clock told her that it was one minute past one. The rodeo was starting, so it was time for her to start packing. She unzipped the suitcase, flipped the lid open, and screamed. She backpedaled so quickly that by the time she realized that she'd run into Burke's weightlifting bench, her inertia kept her going. As she fell, she had just enough time to think, are you kidding me? Before pain exploded through her shoulders as her upper back crashed into the floor on the other side of the bench. She wiggled a little to get her entire back flat on the floor, and then she just lay there with her feet draped over the bench, wondering if she'd broken any bones. Her concentration traveled down her spine, one bone at a time. No, probably not broken. The pain was already receding. Was her life broken? She didn't need to concentrate to answer that question. Yes, it was broken. And as if today wasn't hard enough, God had now allowed her to injure herself by falling down for the first time in years. Slowly, she pulled her legs off the bench and rolled onto her side. She didn't want to get up. She didn't want to have to deal with what was in that suitcase. She didn't want to have to pack. She didn't want to have to leave her husband. Stop being such a victim, an annoying voice in her head said. Get up off the floor. She used the bench to push herself to her feet. She hated this bench so much. She'd always hated it. She'd hated it when he had spent money on it, though he'd gotten it used and hadn't spent much, and she'd hated that his entire, Jim, had to live in their tiny bedroom. If she had any hobbies, she sure wouldn't ask Burke to keep them in the bedroom. But she didn't have any hobbies. She only had work and paying the bills. She couldn't even complain about all the work that went with having children because Burke wasn't ready yet. This thought brought a fresh wave of anger that rejuvenated her. She sneaked up on the suitcase, trying to psych herself up. You can do this. She peeked into the suitcase, and her stomach rolled, but she didn't screech again. It helped that this time, no giant mama mouse was peering up at her with little beady black eyes. This time there was only a giant pile of stuffing, pulled from what, she didn't want to know, and five teeny, tiny mice curled up, unmoving. They were pink and naked and disgusting. And she thought they were dead until one of them squirmed and she nearly screamed again. Her head jerked up. Where was Mama Mouse? Ava's eyes flitted around the room, but nothing moved. She saw nothing gray. What a terrible mother. She'd run off and left her babies at Ava's disposal? Her eyes fell on the babies again. This was so disgusting. And what a fitting metaphor. While Burke had spent the last 13 years flitting around the nation chasing mean cattle, her suitcase had become the most inviting mouse condominium in town. Because Ava Honeywood never went anywhere. She started to sit on the edge of the bed, decided that was too close to the missing mama mouse, and retreated to the hated workout bench, where she sat and cried. She didn't have the energy for this. What was she supposed to do? She wasn't about to kill five baby mice. No matter how much she loathed them, she wasn't a mouse murderer. Definitely not a baby mouse murderer. Could she move them out of her suitcase without hurting them? Were they like baby birds? If she got her scent on them, would mean Mama Mouse abandon them? Or maybe she already had. Ava forced herself to a stand. No matter what she was going to do, she had to get started doing it or she was never going to get in the truck. She looked around the bedroom for inspiration, 
didn't see any, and headed into the living room, where she found it. She and Burke were being evicted, and she had been collecting boxes for the move. But when she'd actually started packing, Burke had gotten angry. He was going to win the next one, get the prize money, and catch them up on rent. How dare she not believe in him? Her lack of faith made it harder for him to win. He didn't want to ride into the ring knowing that his wife didn't believe in him. So, though it was true, though she didn't believe in him, well, she did believe in him as a man, but no longer as a bull riding champion, she had stopped packing. But she'd left the empty boxes strewn about as a silent rebellion. She grabbed one of them now, started back toward the bedroom, and then spun around to go to the kitchen to fetch a dustpan. Chapter 2 Ava eased the metal dustpan into the suitcase. Fear told her to shut her eyes, but she couldn't because then one of those naked pink baby mice might spring to life and bite her hand. They could be rabid newborns for all she knew. She paused to consider if newborn mice had teeth and then decided it didn't matter. Teeth or no teeth, they were dangerous. When she'd returned to the bedroom, she'd half expected to find out that mean mama mouse had returned to care for her little UNS, but there was still no sign of the matriarch. So now, before Ava scooped them up like dust bunnies, she scanned the room again, just in case Mama was poised somewhere to charge. But it appeared that the coast was clear. So Ava held her breath and very carefully, slid the dustpan underneath the nest. Only one of the babies moved, and it was a different one than last time, so at least two of them were alive. Parts of the nest disintegrated as she jostled it, so she slowed her movement even more. She didn't want to harm these little pink devils, she didn't even want to wake them up. Finally, she had the pan slid under the entire nest. Now came the hard part. She exhaled, wobbling on her feet a little. She was a bit dizzy from her lack of oxygen. She lifted the dustpan, praying that none of them moved. If one of them picked up their tiny alien head and looked at her with those beady blind eyes, she knew she would panic and drop the whole business. With the dustpan held out in front of her, she slowly crossed the small room to the cardboard box. Why she hadn't thought to put the box on the bed, she didn't know, and she would never forgive herself for that lack of forethought. She was at the box. Here we go. Executing a perfect squat, she lowered the nest into the box, deciding to leave the dustpan right where it was. It had been her mother's. It had probably been her grandmother's. She didn't care. It was worth sacrificing a family heirloom to be done dealing with this dastardly rodent family. She'd never been much for sweeping, anyway. She straightened and looked down at the pathetic creatures. Just so you know, I would take you outside where you belong, but then I'm afraid your mother would never find you. She stepped back from the box and scanned the room again for the missing mouse. She hated to leave these babies defenseless. But what else could she do to help them? Besides, she had things to do. She had to hurry up and pack so she could get out of this room. Out of this house. Out of this life, this corner she had accidentally painted herself into. But there were still an awful lot of mice remnants in her suitcase. So she vacuumed, washed, and then Lysol the suitcase. Then she sat down and looked at the clock. This was ridiculous. If someone were watching they would think that she was stalling, that she didn't really want to leave. And they would be partially right. She didn't want to leave her husband. She had to. She had to leave him, or nothing was going to change. And she hadn't married him so that she could spend the rest of her life alone and broke. She stared at the empty suitcase. The Lysol still wasn't dry. Oh well. She would start packing anyway. She'd be sorry when she got to her mother's house and all of her stuff smelled like Lysol, but she would deal with that then. For now, she had to get moving. One armload at a time, she transferred her clothes to her suitcase. It didn't take long. Her shoes and boots didn't fit, so she threw those into a few plastic sacks, which she loaded into her truck with her suitcase. Then she went back inside to make one last round. She went from room to room, making sure she wasn't leaving anything beloved behind. She already had her many books and her photo albums in the truck. She'd done that before Burke had left for Wyoming, hoping that he'd notice and take her threats to leave more seriously. 
he hadn't noticed. Or at least he'd pretended not to. Her eyes landed on her grandmother's turkey platter. It was hung on the wall, so she dragged a chair over, climbed up onto it, and wrestled the platter out of its holder. She returned to the floor and hugged the platter to her chest as she went through the rest of the house. She saved the bedroom for last. She hated to leave the dresser. She'd had it since she was a kid. But she didn't want to deal with it. And her mother was being nice to let her move back in. She didn't want her to also have to watch that beat-up old dresser come back up the walk. She peeked in on the mice one last time and then backed out of the bedroom. Goodbye, house. I never liked you much, but you've been good to me, and I'm grateful to you. She headed for the door, and her phone rang in her pocket. Her whole body went cold as fear gripped her in ice fingers. It couldn't be Burke. The rodeo had started. She told herself to calm down. It could be anyone. But she couldn't shake the dread as she laid the platter on the couch so she could pull the phone out of her pocket. When she saw the Wyoming number, she felt as if she'd been enshrouded in darkness. She didn't know how she knew, but she knew something was very, very wrong. Chapter 3 He was standing in the middle of a prairie, the pretty grass waist high. He didn't think prairies like this existed anymore, especially not this big. It stretched out around him in all directions, as far as he could see, nothing but grass. Where was he? How did he get here? Why was he here? He strained to remember, but he couldn't. His head hurt. He was tired. He wanted to sleep. He looked down at the ground. He couldn't just curl up in the grass. There would be snakes. There could be rattlesnakes. He had to get somewhere safe. He had to get home, but where was home? He heard a sound. Like a bird, but coming from the ground. He walked toward it, and train tracks appeared in front of him. He hurried to them, and then stopped and looked east and then west. Straight as an arrow as far as the eye could see in both directions, train tracks. He heard the noise again and looked down, right into the terrifying eyes of a giant badger. He screamed and jumped backward, lost his footing, and tumbled into the grass. Unsure which was more of a threat, rattlesnakes or badgers, he scrambled to his feet twice as fast. By the time he'd brushed his hands off, the badger lay in front of him, looking up. Its body was like a giant, ugly, fat, flat, furry pancake. He would have jumped away again, but he'd depleted his energy stores. He wasn't sure how he'd only fallen down, but he was exhausted. Slowly, he tried to take a step back. But the badger pushed up with its legs and looked right at him. Somehow, it was only then that he noticed a tiny bow slung over the badger's shoulder. Beside it, a quiver full of thin arrows with tiny black and white feathers on the ends. As if this creature wasn't terrifying enough, it is also armed. What is your name? the badger asked. Queasiness washed over him. Am I on drugs? He didn't think that he did drugs, but that was the only thing he could think of that would explain a talking archer badger in a 19th century prairie. The badger was waiting for an answer. I don't know, he admitted. This way. It turned and waddled away, and he watched it go. Was he really going to follow a talking badger? To do so was to admit that such a thing existed. He wasn't sure he wanted to cooperate with his own budding insanity, but as he wrestled with this decision, the badger looked over its shoulder and snapped, this way. His body went cold. What choice did he have, really? He followed the badger back to the train tracks, where it disappeared into the earth. He breathed a sigh of relief. But the chirping was back, and he bent to see three baby badgers in a hole. They all stopped chirping and looked at him. Even though they were babies, they were not cute. They looked like tiny outlaw bandits ready to rob him blind. Some combination of these little devils had dug a hole under the train tracks, wouldn't it be easier to walk over the tracks? He heard it again. This way, and he straightened to see the original badger on the other side of the tracks, staring at him expectantly. Was this the mama badger or the papa badger? He had no idea, and he didn't want to check. He didn't need to know. 
deciding the orphaned baby bandits were the least of his worries, he followed the leader, choosing to go over the tracks rather than under. It seemed more rational. He followed the badger out into the prairie, trying to think of a way to ask a terrifying badger what, exactly, was going on. Chapter 4 Ava asked her phone to give directions to the hospital in Cheyenne. It told her that she would arrive at half past eight. A five hour drive. She groaned. Not because she hated driving, which she did, but because she wanted to be in Cheyenne right now. She buckled up and pointed her truck south. Then she started driving, but she'd only gone a mile when she realized she had a bigger, more immediate problem. She pulled her truck into the gas station parking lot, but she didn't pull up to the pump. She was pretty sure she had one last lonely 20 in her purse, but that wasn't enough to get her anywhere, let alone Cheyenne. She parked the truck and turned the engine off. Then, with a shaky hand, she unzipped her wallet. Yep. There was a 20 in there, all right. But that in a few pennies was all she had to her name. She felt sick. What was she going to do? She had two credit cards in her wallet, but they were both overdrawn, and she knew neither of them would work. Or maybe one of them would. Would a gas pump in West Hope, South Dakota really be able to talk to the computer at credit card headquarters fast enough to figure out that her account didn't have room for a tank of gas? She knew that she'd pumped gas before and not had the charge show up for days. It was worth a shot. She would get herself a tank of gas. She could deal with the overage fees later. She had to get to Cheyenne now. Would one tank of gas get her there? Her truck wasn't exactly fuel efficient, but yes, she thought that it was possible. She started her truck again and pulled up to the pump. The station was crowded on this summer day, and she tried to be discreet. She wasn't delusional enough to think that people were paying attention to her, but if this didn't go well, she didn't want witnesses. She'd had a credit card declined before. There were always witnesses, which made it so much worse. Card declined. She looked around to make sure no one was watching, and then she tried her other card, which didn't work either. Because she didn't know what else to do, she got back into the truck. Think, she told herself. You are a grown woman. You can figure out a way to buy gas. And then suddenly it was all too much. Her husband was in a hospital in Cheyenne, possibly dying, and she was trapped in West Hope because she was too poor to move. Terrified of losing him and furious with him for getting them into this situation, she burst into tears and laid her head on the steering wheel. Please, God, she whispered. Help me. Help us. Someone knocked on her window, and Ava's head jerked up. Oh great. Dee Dee Bannon, the richest woman in the state just who she wanted to see right now. She cranked her window down, wishing her face weren't quite as wet as it was. Hey, Dee Dee. She wiped her cheek with the back of her hand. Sorry, I'm sort of having a day. I had a feeling, she stepped closer to the window, and Ava grew very self-conscious. Her shirt was old and faded. Her truck was old and faded. She felt old and faded. What can I do to help? Ava sniffed. She could buy her a tank of gas, but she wasn't about to say that. Hey, Dee Dee's smile was completely gone now. Something's really wrong. She nodded. It's Burke. I just found out. He got hurt today in Cheyenne. Dee Dee's eyes grew wide, and she stood at attention. Okay, what do you need, for real? Are you going there right now? Ava bit her lip. She could not ask this woman for money. Dee Dee looked at the pump and then looked at Ava again. What is it, a five-hour drive? Ava nodded. Do you want some company? Ava shook her head. You sure? If you're this upset, you shouldn't be driving. I'm sure. Ava tried to sound strong. Dee Dee studied her for a long moment and then shook her head. Nope. Sorry. Go park your truck. She nodded toward a nice car parked by the building. I'll drive you. Hurry up. She turned and walked away. Ava could think of no play except to do what the woman said. Chapter 5 
His whole body hurt, but nothing hurt as bad as his head. What had happened to him? Had he been in a fight? Had he been kicked in the head? Had his head been stepped on? Had he been in a car accident? Why couldn't he remember? He opened his eyes, and the sunlight hurt so much that he closed them again. He heard water splashing. This didn't make sense. He'd been following a terrifying badger across the prairie. There hadn't been any water. He opened his eyes again, just a little, and saw his bare legs were wet with water droplets. But something was off. They were his legs, attached to his body, but they were too small, too young. He hugged himself, feeling his arms. His whole body was too small, too young. If he was so young, why was he so tired? It took him several seconds to figure out that he was floating on a raft in a lake. He scanned his surroundings for the badger, and then startled when he saw it, only inches away, paddling with all four stubby legs just to stay afloat beside him. It looked as exhausted as he felt. He heard a faint hissing sound. His hands explored the raft until he found the hole. It was small, but air was leaking out of it. He plugged it with one finger, and the hissing stopped. But it still felt like he was losing something, like something was leaking out of him. He looked to his right and saw dozens of kids playing. They were talking and laughing, but he couldn't hear them. Good thing because he knew the noise would hurt his head. He was so tired. He needed to sleep. He laid his head back and closed his eyes. Don't sleep, a voice in his head said sternly. If you fall asleep, you'll forget to plug the hole. All the air will leak out, and you'll sink. He looked at the badger for help and realized it had stopped paddling. It stood still just ahead of him, looking at him. The bottom of his raft hit something, and he looked down to see the lake bottom. He had floated to shore. When he looked up again, he startled. Just beyond the badger stood a giant turtle on the edge of the water. It was staring at him. It looked bored. Had he ever seen a turtle that big? He thought that if he had, he would remember. Could turtles even grow that big? What did this thing eat, mountain lions? What is your name, the turtle asked. He didn't know, and this made him incredibly angry. The turtle looked annoyed. This way, it said, and then took five minutes to turn around. When it finally did, the badger followed it across the sand to the grass beyond. This has to be a dream. With difficulty, his young legs got him out of the water, and he followed the turtle. On its back was painted an intricate pattern of geometric shapes in red and pink. As he walked, his body dried off, and he grew chilly. Behind him he heard music. He turned to look, and all the kids who'd been playing in the water now stood near the edge of the shore, wearing choir ropes. Their voices melded into a beautiful harmony, and one of the boys near the front played a tambourine. Hurry up, a voice behind him said, and he turned to see that he'd made the turtle impatient. And the badger was snickering. Chapter 6 Ava did not know Dee Dee Bannon well enough to be on a five-hour road trip with her, but to her credit, she was driving like Jessie Combs. Ava was grateful when Dee Dee called her boyfriend, thinking that would distract her for a while, but Dee Dee only talked to him for a minute. After she ended the call, she glanced at Ava. You're acting awfully put together. If that's your thing, then all the power to you, but please don't waste your energy trying to keep it together for me. Ava didn't know what to say to that. She didn't know what she was doing or how she was doing it. Her life was just sort of happening around her. She wasn't even holding on to the safety bar. None of my business, but it might help to talk about it. I don't know what to say, Ava said after a long, awkward hesitation. I think I might be in shock. How did you find out? A nurse called me from the hospital. Dee Dee groaned. So a stranger? I'm sorry. That part hadn't even registered as painful yet. The nurse had been really nice. And did she say what was wrong with him? She said that he was in a coma, saying the word aloud made her shoulders sag under the weight. She had to fight to inhale her next breath. I am no shrink, Ava, but you really need to stop with all the perfect composure. Ava tried to process that and couldn't. 
What do you mean? I mean that if you need to cry, cry. If you need to scream, scream. But feel whatever you need to feel before you explode. Ava tried to relax, tried to tell herself that it was okay, to cry in front of Dee Dee Bannon, but no tears came. Maybe I'm all cried out. I've spent years worried that this was going to happen. Now that it's happened, well, I'm not sure what I have left to give. I'm so sorry, Dee Dee said after a moment. I can't imagine what it's like to be married to a rodeo man. They rode in silence for a few minutes. There are snacks in a bag in the back. And bottled water. If you need me to stop for anything, just let me know. Thank you so much. You didn't have to do this. Yeah, I kind of did. I can't imagine you driving this far alone, knowing what you know, and not knowing all the things you don't know. She shuddered. What a nightmare. Hopefully, they'll have some answers for you when you get there. Yeah, hopefully. It hadn't yet occurred to Ava to want answers. She just wanted him to be alive. She just wanted him to wake up. Did they say what happened to him? They didn't. Only that he'd been hurt in the ring. A head injury. And that he was in a coma. Did they say whether they induced the coma? She sounded hopeful. Ava didn't know what this meant. She knew what induced labor was. She didn't know what an induced coma was. I don't think they said that. Oh, okay. She sighed. Have you told his brothers? His parents are gone, right? I have not, and yes, you're right. She was almost glad for that. His mother would be beside herself with this. Do you want me to call them? Ava looked at her. Do you even know them? Of course. This is West Hope. She looked out the window. Well, this isn't West Hope anymore. Now it's somewhere, Wyoming, but you know what I mean. Yes, Ava did know what she meant, and she felt stupid. She'd gone to school with Dee Dee. So had Wyatt and Burke. I guess I should call them. I really don't mind. But Burke would want Ava to do it. Thank you. I'll do it. She took a big breath and called the ranch. Then, before anyone could answer, she hung up. Shoot. She didn't want to do this to Chase. She didn't know how he'd take it. Was Hudson working today? What day was it? She had to look up his office number and then dialed it. She asked the receptionist to speak to Hudson, and of course he was busy. But once she used the word emergency, followed by the word Burke, the woman said Hudson would call her right back. And he did. And once she had to say the words aloud to Burke's oldest brother, the dam broke. I'm so sorry, she said after saying everything she knew. You don't have anything to be sorry for, Ava. I'm just sorry, I don't know more. I'm sure there's more medical info that you would understand that they didn't give to me. There might not be. Brains are mysterious. Okay, I assume you're heading to Cheyenne. Do you want me to drive you? No, she said quickly. Dee Dee Bannon is taking me. Really? He sounded as incredulous as she felt. I know. It's weird. Dee Dee chuckled quietly. But she offered. Good. That was really kind of her. Okay, I'm going to get there as quickly as I can, but I've got an emergency here too. Let me get my patient taken care of, and then I'll meet you in Cheyenne. If they move him or anything changes, you'll let me know? I will, and can you let your brothers know? Of course. Thanks, Ava, and I'm praying. He paused. For both of you. Ava thanked him and ended the call, and the tears gushed out of her. Good job. I know it doesn't feel like it, but I really think crying helps. Feel free to recline. And the radio is all yours. Or hook your phone up if you want to listen to something. I'll try to stop talking, but I can also keep blabbing if it's a good distraction. Ava didn't know what she wanted. She didn't know what she needed. She reclined the seat a few inches because her back still hurt from the stupid weightlifting bench. 
she briefly wondered how the baby mice were faring, and then she looked at the GPS. They still had hours to go. Burke had never felt so far away. They had just come into Torrington when Ava's phone rang. It was her mother. She almost didn't answer it, but she didn't want to worry her. Hi, Mom. Her mother, understandably, was in full panic mode. You didn't tell me? I'm sorry, Ava said and meant it. I was in a hurry to get on the road. I wasn't really thinking straight. And you're driving? All by yourself? To Wyoming? This part almost made her laugh. She was going to Wyoming, not the moon. And Burke made this trip how often? Alone, usually. Guilt stabbed at her heart. He'd been chasing this dream of his alone for a lot of years now. In the beginning, she'd been so in love that his dream had become hers. She'd gone to all of the events with him. She'd cheered him on. She'd hung off his arm. She'd celebrated the wins, grieved the losses, and massaged the sore muscles either way. But then she'd grown up. And she'd outgrown the rodeo. Someone in their little family of two had to go to work. Someone had to keep the lights on. And so she'd done it, at first, willingly and even graciously. It had been her way of supporting his dream. She would make sure they stayed afloat so that he could make sure they made it big. But they'd never made it big, and she'd failed to keep them afloat. I'm not alone, Mom. Dee Dee Bannon is driving me. Dee Dee Bannon, her mother cried with excessive alarm. Yes, Mom. Dee Dee Bannon. Not Carrie Underwood. Just Dee Dee Bannon. Elizabeth Bannon's little girl? Ava closed her eyes. Suddenly she had a throbbing headache. Perfect. Yes, Mom. But she has her driver's license now. Dee Dee chuckled, and Ava realized with dismay that Dee Dee could hear both sides of the conversation. Her mother kept firing questions at her, and Ava tried to keep her answers short, finally saying, Mom, you know as much as I do. I will call you when I learn more. Okay, honey. I'm so sorry you're going through this. I wish I could take the pain away for you. I know, Mom. But she couldn't. I'll call you when I get there. Okay. Or sooner. I love you. Since she already sounded annoyed, Ava said, can you catch Dad and Graham up on everything? I know Graham doesn't like talking on the phone. Her mother sighed into her ear, and it sounded like a steam pipe had blown. I can do that. Thank you. I love you too, Mom. She ended the call. Your mom sounds like a trip. Yeah, she can be. It's cool that your gram is still alive. Thank God. She is awesome. Gives me somewhere to run to when my mother is being cranky. Chapter 7 He had never been so thirsty in his life. His mouth was so dry it felt gritty. Or maybe that was actually dirt in his mouth. Either way, he was desperate for some water. But there was no water in sight. He hadn't seen any signs, but he was pretty sure he was in the Badlands. He might as well have been stumbling around on the surface of the sun. He had to get out of here, or he was going to die from exposure. He didn't know how he'd gotten here, and he didn't know where his traveling partners had gone, but he didn't see either of them. His head pounding, he tried to orient himself. North would lead to the highway. North would get him out of the desert. But how deep into the Badlands was he? He had no idea. If he was near the southern edge, it was a long walk to the highway. Maybe 30 miles or more. He'd never make it. Was he going to die? He didn't think so, but his thirst argued with him. So did the pain in his head. He had to get moving. If he was going to strike out, he was going to do so swinging the bat. But which way was north? He searched the sky but couldn't see the sun, which made no sense because he could certainly feel it beating down on his skin. There were no shadows anywhere, so that meant the sun was directly overhead, right? But he looked up again and no, there was no sun. None of this was possible. He closed his eyes and tried to feel north. Then he started walking that way. 
the terrain pitched downhill, and he was grateful. Somewhere along the way, his young legs had vanished and left old, wobbly ones in their place. He wished he had a walking stick, the ground was hard and uneven beneath his feet, and he thought that if he fell down, he might not be able to get back up again. He came alongside a large boulder and jumped when the turtle peeked out from behind it. Where have you been, he cried. The turtle didn't answer. The badger sat on the turtle's back like a seasonally inappropriate shawl, grinning like a sadist. He really, really hated that badger. And its stupid little arrows. The turtle started walking east, and he watched him go. Am I supposed to follow you? The turtle didn't answer, but the badger turned around and screamed at him, sending a chill down his spine. What was it trying to do, call every wolf within a hundred miles? Good grief. He hurried after the turtle and the turtle's hitchhiker, but with every step, he grew more tired, and it became more and more tempting to sit down and wait for death, or the end of the dream or whatever this was, but some faint force within him wouldn't let him. So he followed the turtle, and they didn't make very good time. Chapter 8 Ava and Dee Dee reached the Cheyenne Hospital at half past eight. The sun was just sinking over the horizon, which filled Ava's gut with dread. The spacious lobby felt overwhelming, and Dee Dee led Ava to the front desk. When the kind woman behind it offered to take Ava where she needed to go, Dee Dee said, I'll be right here if you need me. Ava turned, surprised. You're not coming? Dee Dee shook her head. I'll be right here. Ava had no wherewithal to argue. Feeling immense gratitude for Dee Dee and shame that she didn't know how to express it. She turned and followed the kind woman deeper into the hospital. She paused in front of Burke's door, stealing herself. Part of her was desperate to see his face. Part of her was scared to. She took a deep breath and then stepped into the room. She cried out and hurried to his side but then stopped, afraid to touch him. He didn't even look like himself. Or maybe he looked like himself, but certainly not like the person she knew him to be. He looked so small, so helpless. No hint of the toughness, or the adventurousness, or the playfulness that she loved him for. A terrifying thought leapt into her mind, it's not him. You're looking at a shell. No. She would not accept that. She couldn't accept that. She bent over and took his hand into both of hers. You had better still be in there, Burke. She studied his face as she repeated herself with less conviction this time. You'd better still be in there. Mrs. Honeywood? Ava spun to see a nurse wheeling a chair into the room. Yes, that's me. I thought you might want a place to sit. She let go of the chair. I've told the doctor that you're here, and she will be here when she can. In the meantime, do you have any questions for me? Ava only had one question, is he going to live? And she didn't dare to ask it. I don't think so. Sorry. I'm a little overwhelmed. No need to apologize. I would be overwhelmed too. Just talk to him, okay? I'll be nearby if you need anything. She smiled and turned to go. Can he hear me? Ava asked without meaning to. She turned back. We really don't know, but yes, I believe that he can. Ava watched her go, and then she used her foot to pull the chair as close to the bed as she could. She didn't want to let go of his hand. She sat and looked at him, though it hurt to do so. Hey, honey, she said, feeling foolish. Not sure what I should say except hurry up and wake up. The tears started again, gushing out of her eyes and stinging her lips. She had been so lonely for years, but this was the loneliest she'd ever felt. You're supposed to be talking to him. I'm not really sure what to say to you, she said slowly. Except that I love you, and I need you, and I'm sorry. Her voice cracked on the last word. She hadn't said that word to him in a long time. It had been a long time since she'd had anything to be sorry for. She'd been a saint, and he'd been a jerk, at least that's how it had seemed at the time. Now, she wasn't so sure. Now he didn't look like the villain in the story. And he had really only committed one crime, the rodeo. And yes, he'd committed it over and over and over. But that was who he was. 
that was who she'd married. No one had forced her into that commitment. She'd made it, and she'd meant it. She'd been madly in love with him. And now, looking at his still face, she realized that she still was. You're supposed to be talking to him. I love you. Please come back to me. Don't let it end like this. The tears came harder, and she grew frustrated. How was she supposed to talk to him if talking made her sob? She closed her eyes and tried to think of something to talk about, something that wouldn't make her cry, something encouraging. Duh. She took her phone out and found an online Bible. Then she navigated to the first psalm, and she started to read. Chapter 9 Something is different. He was in the forest, staring up at the jagged peaks of the famed Black Hills. Everything smelled like vanilla. The turtle was still in front of him. The badger had slid off the turtle's back and now walked beside his leg like an obedient dog. It made him very uncomfortable, but part of him was also grateful that the stupid thing was still there. Part of him was scared of losing it. He heard running water and turned away from the turtle's path, toward the sound. He was still painfully thirsty. The turtle didn't stop walking. He couldn't decide what to do, so his thirst made the decision. He hurried toward the water, and the badger followed. Thirty seconds later, the forest thinned out, and there on the edge of a small stream stood a beautiful smoky black stallion. On its neck was painted a bright yellow arrow, complete with feathers, and it pointed toward the sky. The horse turned to look at him. What is your name? it asked without moving its mouth. For once, he didn't care what his name was. He only wanted a drink. He hurried to the edge of the stream, fell to his knees, and bent to drink from the clear water. It was cold and sweet and perfect, and he drank until he needed to take a break to breathe. He sat back on his heels and looked down at the water. He couldn't see his reflection, but he could see the horses. He looked up at it. Is it your turn to show me the way? The horse didn't speak again, but he folded his legs and lowered his belly to the ground. He climbed onto the horse's back, hoping this was what he was supposed to do. Something is different, isn't it? The horse didn't answer, but it stood and lazily turned around. The turtle had returned. The badger sat beside it. They looked the same, but something was different. He wasn't thirsty anymore. His head still hurt, but he was starting to think that he wasn't going to die. Chapter 10 Ava's phone rang at 10 o'clock. It was Hudson, and she stepped out of the room to answer it. The hospital's hallway was silent, and speaking into her phone made her feel criminally loud. Sorry to call so late. I've been with my patient. How is Burke? She told him everything she knew, which was very little, though she talked to the neurosurgeon. I wish you could talk to her and then translate what she said to me. I'll call tomorrow and see if I can make that happen. I'm sorry I couldn't get there today. I will leave here soon, as soon as I know my patient is out of the woods. It's okay. I don't think there's much you can do. Then she thought of something. They want to transfer him to Denver. Can you talk them out of that? He hesitated. If they want to send him to Denver, why haven't they already? I guess they don't have a bed open. I see. Well, if a bed opens, we might want to take it. They will have more resources there. I don't know, how could she explain that she knew Burke wouldn't want that? Burke would want to stay in Wyoming. The surgeon here is super nice and seemed really smart. Okay. Let me see what I can find out. He sighed. I really wish you weren't all alone there. I'm not. I have. Oh no. She'd forgotten about Dee Dee. I'm not alone, she said, though she didn't know for sure that Dee Dee was still nearby. Okay, good. Chase will be there soon. He left already. This casual announcement was a great encouragement. Kind of late for a five-hour drive. You know that once Chase makes a decision, we're not going to unmake it. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'll be in touch soon. And look, everybody's talking about coming. Everybody's trying to get off work or just taking off. So if it gets to be too much, kick them out, okay? 
she knew she wouldn't do that. Burke loved his brothers too much. Yeah, she ended the call and hurried to the lobby. No way Dee Dee would still be waiting there, right? But she was. She looked up quickly. How is he? She sounded sick with worry. Ava shrugged and collapsed into a chair across from her. He looks like he's sleeping. I don't know. Did you get to talk to a doctor? She nodded. She said he has a concussion and that his brain was bleeding? But they drilled holes in his head to relieve the pressure. She choked on the words. They sounded so gruesome. But I didn't really understand if that means that it's not bleeding anymore, and I don't know how that connects to the coma. She took a shaky breath. I didn't know what questions to ask, and I felt so stupid trying to understand. But she said that he might wake up and that I should stay hopeful. She didn't say that he might not wake up, but I'm guessing that's true because she used the word might. Dee Dee slid closer to the edge of her seat. Ava, that's not going to happen. So I've been doing some research, and I'm wondering if this is the best place for him. Ava nodded. It is. Medically, she had no idea. But still she knew that it was. Okay. She leaned back. I'm assuming you want to stay with him. Do you need anything else from me? I'll stay nearby either way, but if you don't need anything, I was going to find a hotel. Ava shook her head no. I don't know how to thank you. You don't have to. Burke is a lion, and we lions stick together. Dee Dee winked. An image of Burke in his football uniform flashed through Ava's mind, and she nearly cried out from the pain of it. Do you want me to get you some food? No, thank you. Dee Dee wrapped her in a tight hug that Ava wasn't expecting. She let go and then handed her a business card. Call me if you need anything. If I don't hear anything, I'll check in with you in the morning. She let go, and Ava wiped away her tears. Then Ava watched her walk through the doors before hurrying back to Burke's bedside, where she opened her phone's browser and picked up where she left off. She was only on Psalm 30 because she'd been repeating some of the good ones. She didn't know if Burke could hear her. If he could, she didn't know if he'd understand. Neither of them had done very well in high school English. Of course they'd been too busy writing each other love letters, an idea lit up her brain. I'll be right back, honey. She ducked out into the hallway, trying to decide which brother to call. Chase was the obvious answer, but he was already on his way. Seth answered on the first ring. How is he? I don't really know, sorry. Are you planning to come soon? He groaned. I'm trying to get out of work tomorrow, though I'm thinking that I might just let them fire me. I can't believe Dustin can't pull some strings. This reminded her that she too had to call in to work. Okay, well, if you come, can you let me know before you leave? I need something from the house. She winced when she realized he would see all the boxes. She didn't think Burke had told any of them about the impending eviction. At this point, who cares? Tell me what you need. If I can't get away, I'll send it with Dustin. They'll let Dustin go, but not you. He has significantly more sway there. She told him what she needed and why she wanted it and was grateful when he didn't act like her request was weird. And also, she took a deep breath. This part he was going to find weird. I have a family of baby mice living in a box in the bedroom. Can you just check on them? I mean, I don't know what you're going to do if they're not okay, but if they are okay, I would like to know. I scared the mama mouse off, and I just am really hoping that she came back to take care of them, so if you could just check and see if they're alive? He hesitated. Sure. I can do that. I know it's weird, she said, but I just really need some good news right now. Chapter 11 The horse had carried him into the most beautiful meadow. He could see the sun now, and its gentle warmth felt like a kiss on his face. He slid off the horse's back and stood looking at the wildflowers tickling his shins. He'd never seen this kind of flower before, at least, he didn't think so, yet they felt familiar, and this familiarity comforted him. His head was pounding, maybe even worse than before, but he wasn't scared anymore. 
though he couldn't see anyone else, he knew he wasn't alone. He sat down in the flowers, and their scent enveloped him. It too was familiar. It smelled sweet and somehow safe. He looked up at the horse. What is going on? Why am I having these weird dreams? Why aren't I waking up? The horse blinked. He lay back and looked up at the sky. Can I pray in a dream? He wondered. Yes, yes, he could. So he prayed that he would understand, that he would know his name, that his head would stop hurting, and that most of all, he would wake up. None of his prayers were answered, but lying there in that meadow, he had never felt so loved. Chapter 12 A noise woke Ava, and she sat up with a start. It took her a second to remember where she was, but as soon as her eyes landed on her husband's face, her stomach plummeted. His eyes were closed. I'm sorry, a woman in scrubs said softly. I didn't mean to wake you. How is he? Ava's voice sounded hoarse. He is stable. Sunlight poured through the windows. Ava looked at her phone, but it was dead. What time is it? She looked at her wrist. Ten past eight. Oh no. She jumped up. She had to call in to work. Is there a phone I could use? Sure. I'll show you. She led her out of the room and to a small nurse's station. Then she held her hand out. Do you want me to charge your phone? That would be great, yes. She suddenly had to go to the bathroom, but she needed to call work first. She handed her phone over and then picked up the hospital's cordless. The kind nurse disappeared, and Ava dialed the familiar number. It took her several tries to navigate the automated system, but she finally managed to reach a real human. The woman in HR was pleasant and expressed sympathy for the situation, but they would need to find someone to replace Ava immediately, and if that someone chose to stay on, then they could not hold Ava's position for her. Ava's eyes grew hot. She thanked the woman and hung up, fighting back tears. Then she went to find a bathroom. Fine. She'd hated that job anyway. And what did a stupid low-paying job matter when she had no home and her husband was dying without health insurance? Don't think like that. He's not dying. Fine. He wasn't dying. But the rest of it was still true. And even if he lived through this, it wasn't like he was going to get back to work soon. She found the bathroom, ducked inside, and let the tears come. Just let him live, she prayed. They could figure out the rest later. But first, she needed him to be alive. She went to the cafeteria and spent three of her last dollars on a cup of coffee that burned her mouth, but it tasted so bad that maybe it was a good thing she'd burned off some taste buds. When she got back to the room, Chase was sitting in her chair. He jumped up and motioned to it. No, go ahead. I slept in that thing. I need to stand for a bit. Neither of them sat, and the chair stayed empty. Ava looked down at her cup. Sorry, I didn't know you were here, or I would have gotten you a cup too. He looked past her, and she followed his gaze to a small white paper sack and a large paper cup. I brought you a coffee and some food. It might be cold though. I didn't want to wake you up. She looked at him quickly, but he was staring at Burke. You've been here a while? He nodded. Not long, though. She traded her cup for the larger, colder one, which tasted much better. I don't like this, Chase said, and it was almost like he was talking to himself. I don't like seeing him like this. Doesn't even look like him. It's not him, that annoying voice said again. It's just a shell. She silently yelled at that voice to shut up. I've decided it's like an optical illusion. All this extra stuff around him, she waved her hand at the equipment, the bandages, the tube running into his nose, make him look small, but he's not small. He's in there as big as ever, and he's trying to wake up. Chase looked at her with surprise in his eyes. The Psalms had emboldened her. That's good to hear. I'm serious. His surprise faded. I believe you. And she knew that he did. He left the room without explanation, and she unwrapped the breakfast sandwich, which had also grown cold. 
she chewed without tasting it and had to wash it down with the coffee. Burke's nurse came and went again without saying much, but on her way out, her own phone rang with a familiar tune. Ava couldn't name it, but she knew it was some classic. Music, she thought. She should play him music. Vaguely, way back in the recesses of her mind, she remembered hearing something about living cells responding positively to classical music. So when Chase came back into the room carrying another chair, she asked him to bring some up on his phone. He raised an eyebrow. Classical? You've been spending too much time with Hudson? She shook her head. I don't know. I don't know how any of this works. I'm willing to try anything. I wasn't criticizing. In seconds he had music coming out of his phone, and he set it on Burke's bed by his free hand. Then Chase pushed his chair into the corner farthest from the door as if he was trying to stay out of the way. Or maybe stay hidden. Ava sat in her chair. Thank you for coming. Chase only grunted, but she was able to translate. She'd been around the family enough to be able to speak Chase. His grunt had meant, that's a stupid thing to say. I had to come. They sat listening to the music for a long time before Chase said, Do you wear perfume? For just a second, Ava thought that was an absurd question, but then she caught up to his thinking. I don't, not really. Too bad too. It was a good idea. Did you ever? Sure. I used to wear this awful, cheap stuff. She nearly laughed at the embarrassment of it, but she didn't have the energy. Often? Yeah, her embarrassment deepened. Do you still have any? No, she didn't. She didn't know if they made it anymore. He grabbed his phone from the bed. What was it called? She told him the name, hoping Chase didn't know enough about perfume to know how truly awful it was that she'd worn that brand. They still make it. He stood. I'll go get you some. He put his phone back in its spot on the bed and left before she could argue. The beautiful, intricate music filled the room and made her feel lonely. She stared at her husband's face, working so hard to see any kind of reaction. It was brutal, this waiting. She felt like she might be going crazy. She needed a distraction. Be right back, honey, she said and went to the nurse's station to ask if they knew of a Bible she could use. One of the nurses hurried off, and Ava stood there wondering where she'd gone. But she soon returned with a Bible that she couldn't wait to give her. Ava thanked her, returned to Burke's side, and started reading again, pretty sure that it was the first time Burke had ever listened to the Psalms with a Bach soundtrack playing in the background. Chapter 13 He lay in the meadow, relishing the feel of the sunlight on his face, focusing on the familiar smell of the unnamed wildflowers. He still felt loved, incredibly loved, but there was something else now as well. He could feel an odd strength surging up inside of him. It felt like courage. It made him want to jump in front of a train to save a badger, to run out into traffic to save a turtle, to ride a bronc into a rodeo ring, it was so energizing that he could no longer hold still. He stood up and brushed the pollen off his pants. And that's when he heard the music. Chapter 14 Chase knew he wasn't in good shape, but he didn't know what to do about it. He hated hospitals, but he couldn't stay away. This was one of the few things he couldn't hide from. He found the perfume easily enough and then wandered around the store trying to think of something else Burke might want or need, something that would help him. Not finding any inspiration, Chase admitted to himself that he was stalling and pointed his boots to the self-checkout. He knew his mother would scold him for using the self-serve kiosk claiming that he was putting a good person out of a job in favor of a robot, but he couldn't help it. It was so helpful to be able to buy perfume without human interaction. He drove back across Cheyenne with his stomach in knots. In his head he knew that Cheyenne wasn't a big city, but it felt overwhelmingly huge right now. How were there this many vehicles on the roads? He hadn't known there were this many vehicles in all of Wyoming. Of course, it was frontier days, so that was probably adding a bit to the population, or, by the looks of it, quadrupling it. But despite the traffic, he managed to navigate his way back to the hospital. As he walked the quiet corridors of the hospital, he silently prayed that his brother would be awake when he got back to the room. 
He prayed this, and he felt guilty for not having enough faith to believe that his prayers would be answered. He wasn't ready to let his brother go, but he had a gnawing feeling that was the way this was going to go. He'd prayed for a lot of brothers when they were at death's door, and so far, none of them had come back. Chase had resigned himself to this, this was the way of things. Men did brave things, and that bravery cut their lives short. People like to give Burke a lot of grief for being a bull rider, but Chase understood. He had no desire to go risk his life trying to outstubborn an animal that had been bred to be mean, but he understood and supported Burke's desire to live life on his own terms. He stepped into the room and wasn't surprised to see his brother's eyes still closed. He handed the small sack to Ava and then retreated to his corner, from which he could keep one eye on the door. Ava ripped into the bag and box and then liberally applied the perfume. He could smell it from across the room and thought it might wake Burke up just from the sheer potency of it never mind any emotional response. But as she took Burke's hand into hers and leaned over him to kiss him on his bruised cheek, Burke did not stir, and Chase felt like an interloper, like the scene was too intimate for him to be a part of. I'll give you guys a minute. He started to get up. No, Ava said quickly. Please. Don't go. Her adamancy surprised him, and he hesitated. Of course, you can go if you want to or if you need to. She forced a chuckle, and it sounded so tired. Chase feared that this was only the beginning of her nightmare and worried about how she was going to endure it. This motivated him to help her however he could. It's stupid, she said, but I feel like he can feel you here. I want him to hear your voice. Maybe he should say more. He settled back in his seat. Let me know if you change your mind. I will. Now she sounded relieved. So he stared at the wall above Burke's head as Ava stared at Burke's face, but it wasn't long before he grew fidgety. The classical music was driving him nuts. I know that classical music stimulates the brain, but maybe we should play something more meaningful. He was thinking of hymns or something, but Ava said, good idea. We used to have a song. She reached for her back pocket. Hang on. I need to get my phone. Great. Now he was going to get to listen to whatever their song was on repeat. He wasn't sure that would be less annoying than Beethoven, or whatever this was. He longed for quiet. But quiet probably wasn't what Burke needed right now. Ava paused in the doorway. Talk to him while I'm gone. Yeah. He nodded, watched her go, and then looked at Burke. He still hadn't gotten used to seeing him like this. He averted his eyes. Hey, dummy. Why did you pick a fight with a thousand-pound bull? Absurdly, he waited for Burke to laugh, and then even more absurdly, was disappointed when he didn't. Chase groaned. He didn't know how he was going to do this. He hadn't been this uncomfortable in a long time. I need you to do me a favor, Burke, and you've got to admit, I haven't asked anything of you in a long time. He glanced at the door, expecting Ava any second. But I need you to wake up, so we can get out of here. She came back in. You talked to him. Was that a question? Chase nodded. I sensed it. She sat down and fiddled with her phone before stopping the earbleed-inducing music on his. For one precious second, he had his quiet, but then the room filled with the distinctive sound of early aughts pop music. He closed his eyes and focused on his breathing. You can do this, he told himself. You have to. For Burke. Chapter 15 He had fallen asleep in the meadow, and when he woke up, he was inside a building. He sat up and peered into the darkness. He didn't know where he was, but it felt familiar. He stood, crossed the small room and reached for a light switch he couldn't see. The light bathed the room, and he looked around for his animal friends, but none of them were there. He was obviously alone, but he sure didn't feel alone. Was this it? Was this the real world, then? Was he done dreaming? And how was he supposed to know for sure? He went from room to room in the small house, looking for something to jog his memory and finding nothing. Maybe he'd never been here before. He stepped outside into the night and looked up at the stars. It looked like the real world, but if it was, if he was awake now, why didn't he know where he was? 
why didn't he know who he was? He took a deep breath, and when he did, he smelled something new. It didn't necessarily smell good, but still the scent sent a thrill coursing through him. It was a chemical smell, like fake flowers, cloying, so why was he so enthralled with it? He breathed it in again and nearly came to tears. Oh man, you are really cracking up. He needed to wake up for real. Wake up so he could get to a doctor and find out why he was having such bizarre dreams. Had he hit his head? He didn't remember hitting his head, but he didn't remember anything, and the pain in his head sure supported that theory. He went back inside, registering for the first time that the living room was full of boxes. Most were empty. Were these people moving out? Or moving in? He sat back down on the couch and waited. For what, he didn't know. Maybe another animal would show up and tell him this way. Chapter 16 Chase had gone for a walk, and Ava was reading the Psalms aloud when something reminded her of Dee Dee. Abruptly, she stopped reading and looked at Burke. I forgot about Dee Dee again. Of course, Burke didn't answer, but this wasn't even unusual. He had been ignoring her small panics for years now. Should she call her? Was Dee Dee still in Cheyenne? If so, then Ava did need to call her and assure her that she could go home. She had Chase here to help, and more Honeywoods were on the way. She checked her pockets for Dee Dee's card. Where on earth had she put it? She searched the room but couldn't find it anywhere. She wanted to smack herself. How had she lost that? She stood in the middle of the room with her hands on her hips. Now what? She could call the Bannon Ranch and ask for it, but that felt a bit dramatic. The Bannons were busy people. She didn't want to bother them. Maybe I should just go check the lobby, she said to Burke. She was certain Dee Dee hadn't come back to the hospital to sit in the lobby, but she didn't know what else to do. She bent to kiss Burke on the forehead. I'll be right back, sweetie. I've got to go check and see if my rich friend Dee Dee is downstairs. She tittered at the preposterousness of that statement and then nearly cried out in pain when she realized that Burke would have laughed at that, if he'd heard it. You can tell him again when he wakes up, she told herself and hurried to the lobby. Her tired eyes scanned the large room, didn't see Dee Dee, and she was turning to go back to Burke when Dee Dee came through the front doors. Hey, she cried. How is he? Ava stood there a bit dumbfounded. How was she still there? Why was she still there? No change, I don't think. Then she realized she hadn't given Dee Dee any update at all, and tried to fill her in, but her words got jumbled, and she wasn't sure how much sense she was making. Good, Dee Dee said when she'd finished. I just popped out to get some food, but I can go back out and get you some if you want. You, popped, she paused, trying to collect her thoughts. You came this morning and then you left, and then you came back? Dee Dee nodded. Don't think I'm a stalker or anything. I just wanted to be here in case you needed anything. So, do you want me to go get you some food? I really don't mind. No, I'm okay, but thank you. Ava didn't have much of an appetite. Chase brought me a breakfast sandwich. Chase is here. That's great. You don't have to stay, you know. I know. I just didn't want to leave you alone in Cheyenne. It might not be New York City, but it's still not home. But if Chase is here, maybe you don't need me anymore. Ava didn't know what to say. I don't know how to thank you. Dee Dee waved her off. No need to thank me. You just take good care of him and get him home. I'm going to head that way. When I get there, I'll have your truck moved out of that parking lot. Where do you want me to move it? She had no idea. Do you know where my mother lives? No, but I can find out. Want me to have it moved there? That would be great, thanks. Okay, anything else I can do? No way. She had done too much already. She'd known the Bannons were nice people, but this was above and beyond. Oh. I almost forgot. She handed her a plastic sack. I picked you up a few things. Ava peeked into the bag to see some toiletries, an assortment of protein bars, some candy, and a phone charger. 
she sighed, and closed the bag. Her eyes grew wet. Again, I don't know how to. Dee Dee silenced her with a hug. You don't have to thank me, Ava. We lions stick together, remember? Ava started to say thank you again and then felt foolish, so she clamped her lips shut. Call anytime. Dee Dee spun around and nearly ran into Seth, who was trailed by Dustin. Oh look, Dee Dee said. What good timing. A changing of the guards. And then she was gone. What was that all about? Dustin asked, but Ava didn't have the energy to answer. Come on, I'll take you to Burke. They followed her, but a nurse stopped them to explain that Burke couldn't have more than two visitors at a time. Seth volunteered to wait, and Ava followed Dustin into the room. He took his hat off as he said, Hey, you played that song at your wedding. She was touched that he remembered. Yep. You and me, by Lifehouse. She never got tired of this song, unlike Chase. She didn't think he had recognized it, and she had known it was driving him crazy. He twitched a little every time it started over. Dustin handed her an iPad. I made a playlist of songs I know he likes, and some that he should like. No pressure, of course. I just wanted to do something. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Her phone was nearly dead again anyway. She turned off their song and started Dustin's playlist. The familiar opening notes of Rank Rider's anthem filled the air. She raised an eyebrow. Really? Dustin had really put together a playlist of rodeo tunes? Sorry. Like I said, I was thinking of songs he likes. Let's get him out of here, and then I'll be thrilled to make you a playlist. Please use happy songs. I will. The moment had grown too real. She needed some levity. Any Mindy Rose tunes on here? He missed her teasing tone, or maybe she'd failed to have one, because he said matter-of-factly, no. She doesn't have any rodeo songs yet. Yet? Yeah, she promised Burke that she'd find him a good one. She did. This was news to Ava. She hadn't realized Burke and Mindy were so chatty. Not that she was jealous. She'd never been threatened by Burke being friendly with other women, even in high school. But this news made her feel as if she were being left out of his life. He had an inside joke with a country music superstar, and he hadn't bothered to share that with her? That felt like a crushing blow. She's already talking about how she can help. I know you're not ready to think about it yet, but when you are, she'd be happy to do a benefit concert or something to help out with the expenses. The thought struck terror in her heart. All those people? No way. She suddenly had a new understanding of Chase's crowd avoidance. Or not. Like I said, if the time comes. Dustin stepped closer to the bed and swallowed hard. Would you like a moment alone with him? She started to get up. No, no, he said quickly. I'm not about to say my goodbyes or anything. I just don't like seeing him like this. Yeah, that seems to be the common reaction. Burke was the freest spirit she had ever known. Seeing him bound to a bed was jarring. It's like playing the wrong chord in the middle of the chorus. Just makes my teeth ache. Yeah, she said, though she didn't really get the reference. She settled back into her chair. Wow, it really makes a man feel helpless. Yeah, she said again. Dustin lingered for four rodeo songs before saying, I guess I should let Seth have a turn. How did you bust him out? Dustin puffed out his chest dramatically. I threw my weight around. Under other circumstances she would have laughed, but she was too tired. You didn't get him fired, did you? No, not at all. We found someone to cover for him. He put his hand on Burke's shoulder. You need to wake up, Burke. We need you around for a long time yet. He let go of his hand and smiled at Ava, his eyes wet. I'll go get Seth. He clamped his hat back on his head and left without looking back. Chapter 17 Seth stepped into the room and his stomach rolled. Part of him wished he hadn't come. 
he almost felt like coming was admitting the severity of the situation, that if he'd stayed away, maybe he'd help convince the universe that this wasn't such a big deal, that Burke might not be in much danger, that this hadn't been worth driving to Cheyenne. He forced himself to smile at Ava and then discreetly handed her the bundle of letters. She thanked him and said, that's it? I thought there would be more. That's all I could find. Sorry. You didn't read them, did you? She laughed awkwardly. I would never, he said, trying to make his voice light. The whole room was too heavy. She thanked him again. Don't mention it. And I saw a box with a metal dustpan in it, but there were no mice. None, she cried with more investment than he'd expected. None. You guys didn't get a cat, did you? She laughed at that. Are you kidding? Another mouth to feed? She looked down quickly as if she'd regretted saying that. My guess is that their mother moved them somewhere she thought safer. I hope so. He focused on Burke as Garth Brooks's a rodeo gave way to a bucked off. He shuddered. Sorry, this playlist is brutal. Yeah, but if Burke can hear it, I know he loves it. Did they say whether he can hear anything? He tried not to sound as desperate as he felt. They don't know for sure, but lots of people think that he can. She sighed. Or they're just telling me that to give me something to do. Seth tried to think of something profound to say, something that would encourage Ava, or something that would inspire Burke to pop his eyes open and jump to his feet, but he had nothing. Sure do wish I could think of something to do to help. Just being here is helpful, she said. Let Burke know that you love him. He did. Of course he did but he wished he knew of a way to put that love to use. Chapter 18 He was in a tunnel. It was cold and damp, but he could see light ahead. He'd heard stories of people going toward the light when they were on their way to heaven, and, nothing against heaven, but he hoped that wasn't what was happening here. Though he couldn't remember any details of his life right now, he knew he wasn't ready to die. And so he kept walking. Behind him lay complete and utter darkness. He'd risk the light. His head pounded, and his legs were tired, but he focused on taking one step at a time. Just hold on. Left foot. Right foot. One more second. And the closer he grew to the light, the more he felt that presence that he'd felt before. It grew stronger with every step, and he wondered if he wasn't walking toward that presence. Maybe the light was that presence. Or maybe the presence was the light. Chapter 19. It was late. Seth and Dustin had gone to find a hotel room, leaving Ava alone with her husband. She'd read him several of the old love letters, which were cringeworthy, but she'd read them anyway, hoping some word or phrase might jog a memory. But she discreetly tucked them away once Chase returned from his very long walk and settled in his corner. The nurse had told him that he had to leave at the end of visiting hours, Chase had given no indication that he'd heard her. The nurse hadn't returned to enforce her order, so Ava assumed she wasn't that invested in it. A new nurse had come on duty since then, and Ava wasn't sure she'd even seen Chase. This seemed unlikely, but he did have a way of holding perfectly still. It was eerie. He sort of blended into the background. Ava didn't understand how she was still awake. She'd never been so exhausted. Her eyelids felt like she was wearing lead eyeshadow. Every muscle in her body felt weak, like she was a scarecrow who might fall over if the wind blew just right. Part of her lack of sleep was due to her reluctance to let go of Burke's hand. It was hard to fall asleep with her arms stretched out. Sometime after midnight, she checked the door to make sure she wasn't about to get caught, and then she draped the top half of her body over his arm and lay his head on her chest. It wasn't comfortable, and yet it felt amazing. She relished the warmth of his body, so grateful his strong heart was still pumping that courageous blood through it. His chest rose and fell with his breath, and though of course she'd known that he was breathing all this time, it was encouraging to be this close to it. She didn't think she'd be able to fall asleep like this, but she did, waking only when Burke squeezed her hand. She sat up with a start and looked down at his fingers, which were curled around hers. They hadn't been like that before, right? No, they hadn't. She had been holding his hand. 
he hadn't been holding hers. Or maybe she had manually curled his fingers around her hand. She'd done that before, but she was certain she hadn't done it this time. She held her breath, staring at his hand, unsure of herself. Maybe she'd dreamed it. Wishful thinking. If it had been real, he would have moved again by now, right? She looked at his face, straining to see any sign of change, but there was nothing. What's wrong? Ava jumped. I thought you were asleep. I was. What happened? I don't know. She didn't want to get Chase's hopes up. She didn't want to get her own hopes up. Ava. His tone was stern. Tell me. I think his hand moved. Saying it aloud made her more confident in what she'd felt. Press the button. Chase was out the door before she'd realized that he'd stood up. She looked at the call button. She was nervous to press it, not sure she'd felt what she thought she'd felt, but Chase had believed in her, so she didn't want to leave him out there hanging. She pressed the button. Please, Burke, whether you just did that or not, now is a really good time for you to wake up. She squeezed his hand as hard as she could. Please, sweetie. Please come back to me. Chase came back into the room. She says she's coming. He sounded skeptical, and sure enough, 30 seconds later, he went to check on her. The longer the nurse took, the more Ava doubted what she'd felt, and by the time the nurse did show up and made it clear that she did not believe Ava, Ava didn't believe herself either. I'm sorry, Ava said when everything had calmed down. Nothing to be sorry about. If they knew him, they would have believed you. This brought tears to her eyes. Chase had more faith in Burke than she did. She had to step up her game. And Chase had more faith in Ava than she did in herself. Please, Burke. Prove him right, she said, not caring whether Chase heard her or not. She laid her head on his chest again, this time positioning herself so she could see their intertwined hands. And this time she stayed awake. Chapter 20 He had reached the end of the tunnel and now he stood staring out at the light. He couldn't see anything else. Just bright, white light. It was a little like staring at the sun except that it didn't hurt. This light was the most inviting thing he'd ever seen, and he wanted so badly to walk right into it, but he couldn't. He couldn't even take a single step. He'd been trying for what felt like hours. Over and over his brain told his feet to move, but they refused. It was like they weren't connected. He was starting to grow tired, starting to think about giving up, maybe even turning around, when he heard voices. He didn't know who they were, but they sounded familiar. He could make out some of the words, but no full thoughts. Nothing made sense. Start the music, pale, eat something, praying. The words were distorted, as if he were underwater. It was almost as if some of the words were reaching his ears faster than others. It was all very disconcerting. He was desperate to hear more of the words, thinking that then he would be able to put them all together and figure out what was going on. He had to get closer. He had to get out of this tunnel. His growing frustration was the only thing keeping him from giving in to his growing exhaustion. He was going to step out into this light if it killed him. Chapter 21 The room was full. Maybe too full. Chase had gone for a walk. But Dustin, Seth, Wyatt, and Olivia were there. Olivia had brought a cooler of food, and it felt more like a party than a bedside watch. Ava was trying to ignore the hubbub. She sat with her chair pushed tight against the bed. She'd woven her husband's calloused fingers around hers and then pressed his fingertips into the skin of her hand. If he was going to squeeze her hand again, and she had convinced herself that he was, she wanted to make it as easy as possible for him. So she sat staring at his hand, listening to the conversations around her, and giving Burke a prompting squeeze every 30 seconds or so. So this time, when he squeezed her back, she had no doubts. He did it again, she cried. She jumped up and pushed the button. Then she looked at everyone, who had fallen silent and stopped moving as if she'd yelled freeze. Go get someone. She cried to Seth before realizing that none of the people in this room had been told about the possible squeeze from the night before. 
Despite the fact that Seth couldn't possibly understand what she wanted from him, he took off. She wanted to explain to everyone, but she didn't want to take her focus off Burke. Dustin, can you call Chase? Sure, but I doubt he'll answer. Text him, then, please. He needs to know this. Know what? He asked hesitantly. Burke just squeezed my hand. He did it once last night. Chase was here for it, so he'll want to know that it happened again. Please tell him there's no doubt now. He's in there, and he's trying to get out. People started moving then, picking up and clearing a path for the flurry of activity they were all expecting. This time, when the nurse showed up, Ava stood up and spoke with strength. He squeezed my hand. I saw it. I felt it. Now what do you do when you're sure that he moved? The nurse hesitated. What's the next step? Ava said, her shoulders back. Wyatt came to stand closer to her. She appreciated his support, but she resented needing it. But it worked. The nurse finally said, I'll go tell the doctor. A different nurse arrived seconds later, loudly scolding, we can only have two visitors at a time. There are way too many people here. You all need to go to the waiting room. The siblings started arguing about who would stay, and Ava wished Chase would come back. She wasn't sure why. She loved them all, but he was the one she wanted there. As if he'd read her mind, Seth looked down at Burke. Someone needs to find Chase. If Burke is waking up, Chase is the one he'll want to see. Everyone fell silent as their faces showed disappointment. No one disagreed with him. I'll go find him, Dustin said, and then everyone trickled out. Olivia gave her shoulder a squeeze on the way by. The room fell silent, and she sat down again. Keep fighting, sweetie. You're almost home. The wait for the doctor seemed interminable, but when she finally got there, she showed a lot more faith in Ava than the nurse had shown. The doctor pulled Burke's Johnny down off his shoulders and then squeezed the muscle above his collarbone. What was she doing? And why was she doing it for so long? Then Ava realized that she was slowly increasing the pressure of her pinch, in fact, she kept tightening her grip until Ava was wincing. Are you trying to hurt him? The doctor let go. She didn't look at Ava, though. She kept her eyes trained on Burke's face. I am, but only for a few seconds. I'm trying to force him to respond. I won't injure him. You're going to have to squeeze harder. The doctor looked at her. I'm sorry? You wouldn't believe this man's tolerance for pain. Squeeze harder. The doctor started again, light at first and then increasing pressure until she was twisting his muscle into a knot. Beneath the blanket, his foot twitched. They both saw it. Well, I'll be, the doctor said in wonder as Ava let out a small cry of relief. Most people move more than a toe, but it's something. She picked up his chart and scribbled something on it. Okay, keep talking to him. Don't be in a hurry, and don't get frustrated with him. This is usually a gradual process. But keep doing what you're doing. I'll stay close by. She started toward the door and then turned back. You're a good wife, Mrs. Honeywood. The words stunned her, and Ava was still standing stock still when the doctor had gone out of sight. A good wife? Hardly. She'd barely been a wife at all these last few years. Of course, it could be argued that Burke hadn't been much of a husband either. But she'd laid all the blame on him, when now she was realizing that she should shoulder some of it herself. Yes, he'd been addicted to the rodeo, but she'd been angry, cold, and impatient with him. She had been so focused on her wants and needs that she hadn't really thought much about him at all. She sat down again and took his hand. Keep waking up, sweetie. We need to have another chance. She expected something to happen, but nothing did, and she realized the music had stopped. She jumped up to start it again, and Seth came back in as the first notes rang out. How's he doing? She caught him up. I can't find Chase. It's okay. She knew that Chase would get back when he wanted to, when he was ready to. She just hoped he would hurry up. For her own sake, and for Burke's. Chapter 22 
He hadn't noticed the tunnel disappearing, he only noticed that it was suddenly gone. How long ago it had vanished, he wasn't sure. All he knew was that he was now standing in the light. He was pretty sure he hadn't stepped out of the tunnel. It was more like someone had made the tunnel disappear. Whatever had happened, he was grateful. He heard the voices again, clearer now, and they sounded so friendly and nice that a pang of loneliness stabbed at his chest. He didn't know who these people were, but he wanted to be a part of their conversation. He felt left out. How long had he been alone? How long had he been lonely? It felt like a very long time. He squinted, trying to see the people who were talking. They sounded so close, but he couldn't see them. Suddenly a bolt of pain shot through his head right behind his eyes, and he groaned. Did you hear that? A woman asked. Even though he could hear the fear riding her voice, it was a beautiful voice, gentle, musical. A man's voice said, I did hear that. I'm calling Chase again. Who was Chase? He realized someone was holding his hand, and he hoped it was the woman with the pretty voice. He tried to see, but he couldn't. And the harder he tried, the more it hurt. It hurt so bad it was making him nauseous. An angry determination rose in him suddenly, and though he didn't think he'd been in such a predicament before, this determination felt familiar. It felt invigorating. It empowered him. Just hold on, he told himself. Just hold on for a few more seconds. He focused all his attention on seeing what was going on around him. A woman cried out, and his hand was squeezed. Shapes came into view, but they were blurry, and he couldn't tell what he was looking at. Voices grew louder, and the shapes moved. His eyes tried to chase them around, trying to focus, and the failing was frustrating. Slowly, the picture became clearer. A man stood at the foot of the bed. Another man stood to his left. It was a struggle, but he managed to slide his eyes to his right to see the person who was holding his hand, and what he saw, even though the picture was blurry, took his breath away. She was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. Her blonde hair fell around her shoulders in loose locks, and though her makeup and tears had left what looked like soot trails down her cheeks, nothing could take anything away from the brilliant emerald of her eyes. Tiny freckles adorned her cheeks, and her pink lips were wet with tears, trembling, making him feel weak. He didn't like feeling weak, but he couldn't look away from her. Hi, sweetie, she said in that beautiful lilting voice. Why was she calling him sweetie? Who was this woman? Chapter 23 Ava knew instantly. He didn't recognize her. He didn't recognize his brothers. She looked at Chase and could tell that he knew it too. I don't think we should panic yet, Seth said. He's probably still waking up. Seth looked at Burke. Sorry, man, don't mean to talk about you like you're not here. We're just all a little bit out of our depth here. Your oldest brother is a doctor. He might know that, Wyatt snapped. Seth rolled his eyes. Again, sorry. Like I said, we are out of our element here. In case you don't remember, you have a brother named Hudson who is a good doctor. He's so good that he's still home with an injured kid, but we'll call him, and he will explain to us what's going on and we won't be so dumb. Something like a smile tugged at the corner of Burke's mouth. It was such a handsome expression that she felt butterflies in her stomach. She couldn't remember the last time she felt butterflies. High school? Maybe not that long ago. She used to be pretty smitten when she watched him in the rodeos, but even though that was more recent than high school, it was still quite a while ago. Anyway, we are all your brothers, Seth said. Burke's eyes slid to meet Ava's. She could see the pain in them, but she didn't know if it was physical. Except for her, Dustin said. She's not your brother. The confusion in his eyes was breaking her heart. Are you in pain? We can ask for some pain medication? Burke didn't answer her, and she tried to read him the way she always had, but it wasn't so easy this time. Maybe Seth was right. Maybe he wasn't fully awake yet. He wasn't fully himself yet. She looked at Seth. Maybe you should call Hudson. Seth nodded and stepped out of the room as the doctor returned. Sorry to make you wait. 
There are a lot of people here with us today. It's always like this during frontier days. She sounded tired, but she smiled brightly at Burke. Welcome back, Mr. Honeywood. You gave us quite a scare. Burke's expression didn't change. She traveled around the bed examining his body, and the brothers flattened themselves against the walls as if they were trying to be invisible so they wouldn't get kicked out, but the doctor didn't seem interested in doing a head count. Her brow was furrowed and concerned, but with every question she asked, she looked a little less worried, as if he was giving her the answers she wanted to hear. She stopped poking and prodding him and asked if he'd said anything yet. Ava told her that he hadn't. She didn't seem alarmed by this. Okay, Mr. Honeywood. We're going to take this slow, so we don't wear you out too quickly, okay? Your brain is healing, you're doing a great job, and we don't want to rush things. Can you blink for me? Unmistakably, annoyance flickered across his face, and Ava's heart leapt. She'd never liked that expression, but boy did she like it now. Burke was in there. Her annoying, irritable, stubborn, wonderful husband was still in there. He blinked. Great, the doctor said. Can you blink twice? He could, and she praised him profusely. Blink once for yes, and twice for no, okay? Do you understand? He looked annoyed again, but he blinked once. You were injured in the rodeo, the doctor said. Do you remember being injured? He didn't answer her at first, and his eyes looked confused and sad. But then he blinked twice. Okay, we don't need to worry about that. That's very common. She noted something on his chart. Do you know your name? Another hesitation. Two blinks. Do you know where you are? His eyes traveled the room before he blinked twice. Ava thought she was going to be sick. Her legs felt weak. His eyes slid to meet hers again as if he could sense her fear. Are you in pain? He didn't answer right away. Ava knew why. He doesn't like to admit when he's in pain. Of course. I'm going to assume that he is. Her eyes fell to Burke's again. We will try to make you more comfortable, but we don't want to slow down your healing, okay? So you need to figure out a way to tell us if you need more help with the pain management. She lifted her eyes to Ava. Give your wife's hand a good squeeze if you need something. We'll figure out what it is. She seems to know you pretty well. When the doctor said the word wife, Burke's eyes grew wide. And then he just stared at Ava as if he couldn't quite believe what he'd just learned. Ava chased the doctor out of the room. She knew this was needy and annoying, but the doctor didn't seem surprised by it. She answered Ava's question before it was asked. We really don't have much information at this time. But all of this is incredibly normal and not necessarily cause for alarm. You keep having the same faith you have had all along. With every minute, we will get more information that will help us help him. She reached out and squeezed Ava's shoulder. You're doing a great job, but you have a lot of help here. You don't have to try to do it all alone. Maybe you could try to get some rest. One of the brothers will stay with him, I'm sure. Her eyes flitted toward the door, and she chuckled dryly. Probably all of them. Ava watched her walk away and then fell against the cold wall for support. Seth appeared beside her. I don't know if I can do this. She felt as if she might pass out. You can because we're all in this together, and Ava? She looked up at him. Burke is going to pull through this. I know it. Thanks for saying that. She wished she had his confidence. I can't get a hold of Hudson, but I left him three messages. Good. Thank you. Sure. Do you want me to go get you something to eat? Nah. I'm okay. She didn't think she'd be able to eat even if he put prime rib in front of her. She felt nauseous and dizzy. Okay. I want to be able to help you, though, so if you think of anything that I or any of us can do to lighten your load, please speak up. She gave him a sardonic look. You know that I will. I've called one of you every time something has broken for the last five years. Wyatt had built her new front steps. 
Hudson had treated her three times when she didn't have health insurance. Dustin had fixed her refrigerator by standing it on its head for a few hours. She still thought that had been some sort of magic trick. And Seth had fixed her plumbing. Twice. She couldn't remember a time when she'd called on Chase, but that was because she didn't have any animals. Shoot, she thought. She should have called him for the baby mice. You know what might help? Seth said. Even shaking her head felt like a lot of work. Maybe you should get mad. What? Mad at who? The bull? Aren't you angry? You begged him not to do this. He did it anyway. You told him he was going to get hurt. He got hurt. Maybe you'd feel better if you gave him some sass, and maybe that would help him reconnect some wires in his brain. She sighed. I see the sense of what you're saying, but I don't think I can summon up any wrath right now. He looked doubtful, so she added, trust me. I've given him enough sass over the years to last us the rest of our lives. Chapter 24 Seth's phone rang in his hand, and he hurried to answer it. How is he? Hudson asked without preamble. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know who you are. You'd better get to Cheyenne. I'm leaving here shortly. Good. Seth leaned against the wall and looked around. He didn't want to bother anyone with his conversation, but he didn't want to be eavesdropped on either. Has he said anything? No, but he's blinking. Blinking? Yeah, as a way of communicating. Once for yes, twice for no. Hudson fell quiet, and Seth let him think. Finally, Hudson said, well, it's early yet. Good. He's definitely not himself. I guess he really rattled his brain. How is Ava holding up? I don't think she's in very good shape. He scanned the hallway again. I don't want to accuse her of being in bad shape, but man. I know these two people pretty well, and the two people I'm in the room with right now? It's not the two people I know. She's probably pretty scared. It's more than that. She's scared, but she's also, he didn't know. I'm glad we're here. I think she's running on fumes. Obviously not worried about Ava, Hudson fired off question after question about Burke, and Seth did his best to answer them. Then Hudson gave him a pretty convincing pep talk about Burke's progress. When he finished, he said, I'm getting in the truck now. See you in a few hours. It would be more than a few. See you then. Drive safe. Will do. Hudson hung up. It was a good thing that Hudson was coming. They could all have all the hope in the world, but if Hudson acted like Burke was going to be okay, then they would all believe it. But what if Hudson doesn't think he is going to be okay? That would be a catastrophe. Hudson was a horrible actor. If he thought Burke was in danger, he wouldn't be able to hide it, and then everyone would be discouraged. Seth really hoped that wouldn't happen. He wandered around the hospital for a while, trying to think of a way to be helpful. Chapter 25 He fell asleep, but this time he didn't dream. When he started to wake up, he heard the chorus of voices talking about someone named Burke and it took him a few seconds to realize that they were talking about him. What had he done to himself that had made him forget his own name? What did that mean about him? Had he been someone that he wanted to forget? He didn't feel like a bad person, but how could he know? But when he opened his eyes and he saw the beautiful blonde woman gazing down at him, he knew he wasn't a bad man. A woman like this would not love him if he were a bad man. His eyes traveled around the room from face to face, trying to recognize someone, but they were all strangers. One of the strangers stepped forward. I talked to our oldest brother. Hudson. He spoke slowly, which annoyed Burke. He wasn't stupid. He's the doctor. Anyway, I want to tell you what he said because I think it will be encouraging, but you have to let me know if it's too much. I don't want to overwhelm you with information. Who was this little punk? Burke wanted to give him a piece of his mind, but of course he was all the way across the room, and Burke was too tired to lift his finger. The punk took a deep breath. He said you're doing great. Nearly miracle status. 
You woke up sooner than he'd expected, and the fact that you're able to think so clearly and answer questions is a really good sign. Just like the doctor here said, Hudson said not to hurry things, but that this is all good news, and we can stop fearing the worst. This brought zero comfort to Burke. It did seem that the others were pleased by it, though. The woman squeezed his shoulder in a familiar way. Good job, sweetie. He couldn't help but flinch away from her touch. He didn't know her. He didn't like being helpless in a hospital bed, nearly naked attached to a million machines like some kind of weakling. In front of a beautiful woman. But when he saw the hurt in her eyes that his flinch had caused, he said, sorry. The word came out raspy, but at least it came out. The strangers around his bed yelped with excitement. The woman smiled, but he could still see the pain in her eyes. It seemed excessive, like she was more hurt than she should have been from such a small offense, and he wondered if this was cumulative hurt. Had he hurt her before? He didn't know himself, but he thought he was probably capable of hurting her. He didn't feel like the kind of man to even have a wife. Maybe he hadn't been a very good husband. He wanted to ask her these questions, but not in front of these strange men. Maybe this would be easier if he just went back to sleep. He let his eyes, which had been begging to fall shut, do what they wanted. One of the men mumbled disappointment, and a less familiar voice said, he's tired. Let him rest. He didn't think he'd heard that one speak before, but who knew? Everything was so confusing. The woman, your wife, he corrected himself, said, I guess I'm glad we didn't go to Denver. Why is that? Because he wouldn't have wanted to, and we didn't need to. As he wondered what grudge he held against the city of Denver, a small moving picture appeared in his mind, and he didn't know if it was a dream. He could still hear the people talking, so he didn't think so. He could see it very clearly, a little hand pushing a toy yellow dump truck around a braided rug. A dump truck full of mandums. Why was there a dump truck full of mandums in his head? This was not helpful. This must be another dream. He looked around, half expecting to see the badger or the turtle or the horse, but there was nothing else there, only fuzzy gray around this small scene of a dump truck. And then suddenly he knew where the mandums had come from. The dump truck kid had stolen all of his brother's mandums. This didn't make sense. He grew frustrated. Why was thinking so much work? He strained to see who was pushing the dump truck, and then clear as a whistle shattering the silence, he heard a woman's voice yelling. Clearly in reaction to that voice, the little boy jumped up and ran away from the mandums. In the dream, or whatever this was, Burke started eating them. He could taste them. They tasted sweet, but not sweet enough to counter the agonizing longing he felt for that female voice that had just yelled. His mother. He wanted his mother. Where was his mother? Maybe he would recognize her. No, not maybe. He knew that he would. He could suddenly remember her face, framed by long chestnut hair, smiling. In his memory he could see the love in her eyes. She was gazing at him. She loved him. Without opening his eyes, he said, Mom? The voices in the room fell silent. Let's give them some room, one of the men said, and it grew incredibly still around him. The silence lengthened until he was forced to open his eyes to see what was going on. Everyone had left the room except for the woman named Ava, whose eyes were wet. I'm so sorry, Burke. We lost her a few years ago. Do you remember her? The memory was already growing thin, blurry. A little bit. She smiled through her tears. That's great. And it doesn't surprise me. She was a great woman. Somewhere someone had told him that men married women like their mother. So did that mean that this beautiful blonde woman was also a great woman? Chapter 26 I don't know if I can do this, Ava said. Seth sat across from her in the cafeteria. He had badgered her until she went with him, so now she sat with her hands around a cup of coffee and a muffin wrapped in plastic in front of her. The warm cup felt good in her hands, but eating something felt like far too much work. You are doing it. Seth's voice was full of sympathy. She shook her head. Not really. I'm just stumbling along. 
Seth, he flinched when I touched him. It would be bad enough if he forgot about me, but he doesn't even want me. She looked into Seth's eyes. Am I really about to be rejected by my own husband? He shook his head immediately. You are getting way ahead of yourself. Everyone has said that this takes time. His brain is still waking up. He doesn't remember you right this second. It doesn't mean that he has forgotten you forever. And Ava, he's loved you since junior high. He still loves you. He just doesn't know it yet. Seth leaned back. I feel for you. I do. But I also feel for Burke. You know him. He's so strong, so confident, so sure of himself, he's got to be freaking out right now. I can't remember the last time Burke has been forced to be, he searched for the word. Vulnerable? Yeah, that's it. I can't imagine Burke is enjoying being vulnerable. And he doesn't like not being good at something. So if his personality is intact, he's probably pretty mad that he can't do what we're all expecting him to do. He sighed and then started to say something else but stopped. What is it? He shook his head. Nothing. He was obviously holding back. Tell me. It was nothing, Ava. I just, he remembered mom. So that's a good sign, right? She certainly hoped so. I wish she was still here. She would be a rock through all this. Ava needed a rock to lean on. Tears threatened, and she fought them back. She was so sick of crying, but she was tired, and the more tired she was, the harder it was to control the crying. She swallowed hard. Well, I guess I should get back up there. Not necessarily. Wyatt and Olivia are up there. Let me get you a hotel room, and then you can. I'm fine, she interrupted. She was so sick of the charity, and for the first time in a while, she got mad at Burke again. It was his fault that they had no money. You don't have to spend the night there. But it would give you somewhere to go to take nap and to maybe hide out for a while when you need a break. It did sound good, but she couldn't take his money. I'm good. She forced herself to smile. I promise. She stood up and grabbed her still-wrapped muffin. Besides if he's going to remember me, I need to keep reminding him who I am, right? Seth didn't move. I'm not sure that's how that works. She was too exhausted for further conversation, and she dragged herself back toward Burke's room. In the elevator, she tried to drink some of her coffee, but it was too terrible. She stepped off the elevator and ducked into a restroom to dump the coffee down the sink. When she came back out of the bathroom, she crashed into a woman wearing scrubs. It was a good thing that she was no longer holding hot coffee, but she'd smashed her muffin. Sorry, the woman said. But I was waiting for you. Oh no. Why? Oh no. Nothing's wrong. That was most certainly not true. I wanted to tell you that someone from Billing called. She looked down at her clipboard. Someone named Callum Bannon called and told them to send all of your husband's medical bills to him. A choked sob escaped Ava, and she put her hands over her mouth in case another one was going to break out. She didn't know whether to cry with relief or scream with rage. This was a miracle, for sure, and she was so grateful to Callum and Dee Dee, but she was also furious with Burke. Why had he gotten them into this mess? And why had he left her to deal with this part of it? She managed to thank the woman and then carried her smashed muffin toward Burke's room. The tears flowed freely as guilt consumed her. She had no right to be angry with Burke. Not while he was still in intensive care. Chapter 27 Seth watched Ava go and then unwrapped his own muffin. He had almost told Ava what he'd seen in Burke's room, and he was glad he'd stopped himself. Burke had remembered something, something other than their mother. Seth knew this because Burke had given him a dirty look, a look that Seth had seen thousands of times. Seth often annoyed Burke. It had always been like this. And Burke had remembered something, something about Seth, something that annoyed him. That was the only explanation. He took out his phone. He felt so bad for Ava. She was such a good woman, and Burke totally took her for granted. 
It wasn't fair that Burke got to be married. Seth was the one who wanted a wife, the one who wanted a family. He shook his head. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. This isn't about you. He opened the browser on his phone. He was going to get the hotel room whether Ava wanted it or not. Maybe she'd be more willing to use it if it were already paid for. As he was looking down at the phone, he got a message from an unknown number. He would have ignored it, but the first few words of the text showed up. I'm in town. Can I buy you? Who was in town? And what did they want to buy him? He opened the message. I am in town. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Lacey. His stomach rolled. Lacey. He hadn't heard from her in years. What was she doing in West Hope? And why did she want to see him? He typed, no thanks. I can buy my own coffee. But then his thumb hovered over the send button. Wait. Which had the greatest chance of hurting her, this snide message or simply ignoring her? He deleted what he'd written and then closed the app. Do you really want to hurt her? Yes, he did. She'd ruined his life. He didn't want to meet for coffee like they were some casual old friends. He didn't want to ever see her again. How dare she reach out to him like that? She'd probably heard about Burke and was trying to get the inside scoop. Well, she wasn't going to get it from him. He'd already wasted years of his life on her. He wasn't going to give her one more second. Chapter 28 The next time Burke woke up, the cast of characters in his room had changed. There was a new man there, who introduced himself as Hudson. Oh, yeah, the doctor. That was probably a good thing. The pretty woman was back by his side, making him feel self-conscious. Ava. Her name is Ava. And she's your wife. And the annoying brother sat in the corner beside the silent one. Good grief, this family was a lot to keep track of. Hudson was telling him how good he was doing, that he was recovering quickly, but that he shouldn't put any pressure on himself. That was easy for him to say. He wasn't the invalid. Do you have any questions? Hudson asked. Only a million. But one rose to the top of the fray. What happened? Confusion darkened Hudson's face, and he looked at Ava. What happened to me? Burke tried to clarify. None of us were there, Hudson said, but my understanding is that you fell off a bull and hit your head. Hadn't he been wearing a helmet? Wasn't that why bull riders wore helmets? Helmet? Again Hudson looked at Ava. You were wearing it, she said softly. He couldn't bear to look at her. And you hit your head on the bull's head. Seth snickered. He head-butted a bull. Why doesn't that surprise me? Burke ignored this quip, though, because he was focused on Ava's tone. She hadn't been there, right? So how could she sound so sure of what happened? She hadn't said it as if it was hearsay. She'd described it like a witness. Show me. No one said anything for several seconds. Show you what? Hudson asked. He looked at Ava. Show me the video. She looked at Hudson, unsure, but he shrugged. It might help, actually. I didn't know there was video footage. Of course there is, Seth said. It's frontier days. Hudson looked over his shoulder. You've seen it too? Seth nodded. It's pretty impressive. Burke felt something like pride at those words and became less annoyed. Guess you and me are the only ones who haven't seen it, Hudson said, coming to stand beside him. Hudson looked at Ava. Can you bring it up on your phone? She nodded and slid the slim phone out of her pocket before saying. My screen's all cracked. She held her hand out. Can I use yours? Sure. Hudson handed it over, and Burke caught a glimpse of her phone as she put it back in her pocket. Cracked wasn't the right word. That phone was demolished. He looked up at her. Was she a bull rider too? What? She smiled at him. Do you rodeo too? Hudson laughed, as Ava's face fell. 
No, she said softly, and he didn't understand why that question had been funny or why it had made her sad, but he was soon distracted when she held the phone out in front of his face. He took it from her and brought it closer, not caring if Hudson could see it. Seeing the large crowd and hearing their cheering sent a thrill coursing through him. This was followed by an even stronger elation when it zoomed in on the bull. Whoa, that was him. He almost asked for confirmation, but he was embarrassed. Yes, this was him. She wouldn't have handed him a video of someone else. The camera zoomed in on his face, which was partially obscured by the helmet. Wow, was this strange. Part of him recognized this person on the small screen. Part of him couldn't believe it was him. And no part of him could believe he'd ever been this big of a deal. No wonder he'd taken such a risk. The gate opened, and he was off. Silently, he counted off in his head, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to make it. But then the man in the video was thrown, straight up into the air, and when he came back down, the bull reared his head back, smashing the back of his giant skull into the man's head. He bounced off the bull and landed lifeless in the dirt. He closed his eyes as nausea rolled through him. He focused on breathing. Someone tried to tug the phone from his hand, and he tightened his grip. He tried to say, wait, but he wasn't sure he'd managed it. He tried to rewind so he could watch it again, but he couldn't make his finger and the screen do what they were supposed to do. He didn't even know who to blame, his finger or the screen, and he grew increasingly frustrated. I'll do it. Ava reached to help him, and he jerked the phone away from her. He didn't need her help. The pain on her face broke his heart. He looked at Hudson. Can you, he didn't know how to explain what he needed. Seth knew. He stood up. Come on, guys. Let's give them a minute. The men cleared out, and Burke looked up at this strange woman, this gorgeous woman who obviously loved him. This wasn't fair. He needed to stop being such a jerk to her. He needed to love her again or at least pretend that he did. I'm sorry, he said slowly. I don't know how to. She sort of fell into her chair, which brought her face closer to him. He reached out and wiped the tears from her right cheek. She flinched a little as if his touch startled her. What did that mean? Was this woman really his wife? It didn't seem possible, and her flinch had just confirmed that. Tell me our story. Her eyes grew wide, which made them even more dazzling. She sniffled. That could take a while. He held up his hands. I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. Speaking of which, I'm sure it hasn't occurred to you to worry about the cost of all this yet, but if it does, you should know that it's all being taken care of. Oh. Yeah. Are you rich? Something flickered across her face. Something like pain. No, we're not rich. We. He had to get used to that. Not her or him or even you. But we. We have rich neighbors. He felt his eyebrows go up. Why would rich neighbors pay my hospital bills? Because they are also kind and generous and good, and well, you're sort of a local hero. She nearly tripped over the last words. Please, Ava. Saying her name felt like a familiar act, but that wasn't the same as remembering. Be honest with me. Please tell me our story. She chewed her lip. Well, the short version is, we started dating in high school, and we just never stopped. We got married young, and we've lived in West Hope our whole lives. West Hope. That struck a chord in his heart. No kids? She averted her eyes as she shook her head. How old are we? She giggled, which made him feel better. We are 32. 32. Wow. He had 30 years worth of memories to find. How many of them would come back? Would any of them come back? Or would he be left with only one dump truck and some mandums? Isn't 32 a little old to not have kids? He instantly felt bad about his phrasing. I mean I'm not calling you old, I'm. Is something wrong with one of us? Oh wow. Am I always this bad at talking? I don't know. It's been a while. 
His stomach fell. What? Were we in trouble? Why had he used the past tense? Him forgetting everything didn't mean problems were magically gone. Are we in trouble? She hesitated. Trouble is a strong word. What did that mean? Are you always this gentle, or are you using kid gloves because I headbutted a bull? She grinned, which made him feel good. I'm not using kid gloves, she said, and he wasn't sure he believed her. Chapter 29 Ava couldn't believe this was happening. He was asking all the right questions, all the hard questions, and she didn't want to answer them. Not now. Not like this. Marriage is hard, Burke. Even ours. Especially ours. Maybe we could wait till you're physically better before we tackle this. You love me, he said matter-of-factly. I can see it in your eyes. Did I hurt you? When she didn't answer immediately, his eyes widened in horror. Oh no. I didn't hurt you, did I? She shook her head hard and reached out to take his hand. No, no, Burke. You are a good man. You are the best man I know. His face relaxed. Okay, I'll tell you, but only because I'm worried you'll imagine something worse than the truth if I don't tell you. Was our high school really small? Well, that was random. Uh, yeah. Why? He looked embarrassed. Never mind. Go back to the thing. No, really. Why did you ask that? She was amused, but she was trying not to show it. She couldn't believe how readily he was talking to her, and she didn't want to do anything to mess that up. I was just thinking, and I admit, I'm not very good at thinking right now. He frowned. Was I ever good at thinking? Not really, but she wasn't going to tell him that. Yes, of course you were. What were you just thinking? I was thinking that it doesn't make sense that a girl as pretty as you chose me. His eyes lit up. Unless you were really ugly in high school? Did you like have one of those moments in the movies where you took your glasses off and let your hair down and suddenly you were beautiful? He gasped for air. He was talking too much, and it was wearing him out. No, I didn't have one of those moments. Not even close. Quite the opposite. Ava feared that she had peaked in high school. Her looks had gone downhill ever since. But he just called you beautiful, and he doesn't remember what you looked like back then. When we get out of here, I'll show you some pictures. You might even be proud of how pretty I was back then. She smiled. Anyway, I chose you because you were you. And it helped that you were a football star and that you were destined to be a rodeo star. Saying the words made them feel like good words for the first time in a very, very long time. Okay, so I was a catch. What went wrong? She winced. Nothing went wrong, exactly. It's just that, marriage is hard, Burke. Yeah, you said that already. Fine. He wanted it. Here it was. You love the rodeo, Burke. It's your whole life. I can't compete with it. You choose it over me all the time. She felt the tears coming and couldn't stop them. We're broke. We're losing our house, and I'm sorry to say this now, but I was constantly worried that you were going to get hurt and you wouldn't listen to those worries. He was studying her. Was that an I told you so? She shook her head. No. You asked, remember? I remember, he said softly. He caressed her hand. I'm so sorry, Ava. He glanced at the phone. I can see why I liked the rodeo though. Looks pretty fun. Yeah, I'll bet. And it was fun. For a while. But. But what? But now I want you back. I don't want to share you anymore. He nodded. Okay. Her eyes widened before she chuckled dryly. Sure, you say that now. He hesitated, and his features were like flint. He looked so gorgeous that he took her breath away. Am I not a man of my word? No, she said, still breathless. No, you are. 
Okay, then. You've got me. But did she even want him anymore? Of course she did, but what if he didn't love her anymore? She couldn't ask him to honor vows he didn't remember saying. So this rich neighbor isn't willing to pay off our house? She reared back in horror before she saw the playful twinkle in his eye. Was that a joke? Of course it was. Good, cause it's a rental, and no, I'm not going to let them pay for it. He quirked an eyebrow. You're not going to let them pay for it? Are you in charge of the money? Someone has to be. We both are, she made herself say. He shook her hand. Don't look so glum. I told you that I was just kidding. When had he been such a jokester? Not for a long time. Chapter 30 What day is it? Burke asked, rubbing his eyes. Friday. He shook his head, closed his eyes again, and leaned back. Feels like I've been in here forever. She could relate to that. Nope. It's only Friday. I remembered something else about one of my brothers last night. Really? What? Who? She sounded so excited. He concentrated, trying to remember the details. I think it was Chase. We were little, and I helped him sneak a stray cat into the basement. Ava didn't audibly react, so he opened one eye to peer at her. Good grief, even after spending the night in a chair, she still woke up beautiful. You've heard this one. She grinned. Go ahead, though. It's been a while. He tried to concentrate. Now there was pressure to get it right. Do I have the right brother? You do. He sighed. Good. He had that at least. So it was freezing cold outside, and somehow Chase found this scraggly awful thing. That night I was sure it was a black cat, but it turned out it was a gray tabby. It was just so filthy I couldn't tell. Anyway, I'm guessing that he didn't ask first because no good parents would allow a creature that filthy into their house. He paused to give her a chance to confirm that no, Chase hadn't asked permission first, but either she didn't know that detail of the story, or she didn't care about it. So we were outside in the dark trying to catch the thing, which wasn't easy. In fact I don't remember catching it. I just remember trying and failing, and then I remember it being caught, and I remember smuggling it into the basement in a pillowcase. The thing's claws came right out through the fabric. He wondered what they'd done with the pillowcase afterward and hoped they hadn't just tucked it back into the closet, with all the other clean sheets. I've never heard how Chase got it into the pillowcase, only that it ended up there. Good, so he wasn't the only one missing part of the story. He would have to ask Chase sometime to fill in the blanks. Anyway, we smuggled it into the basement, and wow, wasn't it a feral little thing. Burke chuckled, remembering. I remember it flying out of that pillowcase. I was scared to death of it. I wouldn't even come off the stairs, but there was Chase, trying to pat it, clean it, pull the mats out of its hair. It scratched him to pieces. I think it even bit him a few times. So he found a pair of welding gloves somewhere and wore them anytime he got near the thing. I remember we didn't have anything to feed it, so Chase would steal cans of tuna from the cupboard, but he was too honest to actually steal them, so he would leave dollar bills in random places for mom to find. Burke shook his head. I think maybe she might have never noticed the missing tuna cans, but she did notice the mysterious dollar bills. And that's how he got caught. She'd heard the ending before. I guess, so. Yeah, I don't really remember him getting caught. I just remember sitting on those stairs, watching him try to turn a wild cheetah into a pet. He shook his head. What a nut. Yeah, I can't imagine risking my health to try to tame a wild beast. Something in her tone made him look at her, and only then did he catch her drift. That is different. What I do is sport. What Chase did was nuts. No, he hadn't gotten that quite right, had he? He looked down at his blanket and busied himself smoothing it out. What I did was sport. Someone knocked on the door, and the occupational therapist stepped in. He managed not to groan, but he really hated this part of the process. 
She was kind, but she treated him like he was a child, and he didn't think her silly exercises were doing any good. He looked at Ava. Would you mind not witnessing this? She nodded, but she looked disappointed. He couldn't imagine why she would want to stay to watch him practice using a fork, or whatever silly mundane task they were going to work on today, but he wasn't going to give in to the pressure. I'll be back soon. She bent to kiss him on the forehead, and a bolt of energy shot through him. Chapter 31 Ava met Chase in the hallway outside of Burke's room. He held a paper sack and a tall cardboard cup out to her. She thanked him. She didn't have to look in the bag. She could smell the buttery croissant. He'd brought her another breakfast sandwich. He awake? Chase glanced at the closed door beyond her. She nodded. He's in with the occupational therapist. He didn't want me watching. Chase nodded. Can't blame him there. She could, in fact. At least, she had been blaming him. She was his wife. He could do his occupational therapy in front of her. She had to keep reminding herself that to him, she didn't feel like a wife. To him she felt like some strange woman he didn't know. He'd even acted a little nervous around her a few times. Chase turned and went to a short row of chairs set up against a wall. She joined him. Who's watching the horses? A friend has been, but everyone else is headed home, so I expect he'll be relieved soon. Oh. Yeah, they had told her they were leaving. Now she was the one with the foggy memory. That's right. I forget these people have jobs. And I know Olivia had to get back because she's got a bunch of big events coming up. He gave her a weird look. Yeah, a bunch of M, and one extra big one tomorrow. Anyway, did Seth tell you that he's driving Burke's truck back? She couldn't remember. Lots of people had been telling her lots of things. That's nice of him. Yeah, he's a pretty nice guy. He took a long swig off his coffee and leaned back in the chair to wait. Ava knew that Chase was content to wait in silence. She also knew that if she sat there silently, she was about to fall asleep, which would be embarrassing. She tried to think of something to say to engage him in conversation, which was a lot like finding baby ticks on a mule. Has anyone told you what Wyatt is doing to the basement, he asked. Why would she care about Wyatt's basement? But good, at least it was conversation. No, what? You know I was sort of living in it, but it wasn't finished, but now I've mostly moved out to the tack room in the new barn, so the basement is just sitting there. Oh. Not Wyatt's basement. Hudson and Chase's basement. Okay. Well, Wyatt is completely remodeling it, making it really nice. A nice big bathroom and everything. That's nice. He gave her another weird look. For Burke. Oh, she cried. You guys are going to let Burke live in your basement? Burke and you. Till he gets back on his feet at least. I mean, his recovery is miraculous, but it's going to be a while before he can work and bring in some income and we don't want you to be stressed about having to do everything. Wow, she said after a moment. I don't know what to say. Who is paying for all this? She expected to hear the word Bannon, but Chase said, I think Wyatt is paying for most of it. He's got a lot of leftover supplies from other projects. And I know Hudson has put some into it. There's actually money coming in for the events center now. I'd give you all my money if I had any. He chuckled dryly. So they were going to be living in a basement. How many square feet was that basement? She hadn't been down there, but the house wasn't huge, so the basement couldn't be. She and Burke were going to be in close quarters, for a minute anyway, with neither of them working. She wondered how they would do it. How they would get along. The rodeo had been between them for so long. If they took the rodeo out, what would fill that space? Would it be awkwardness, resentment, anger? Would one of them move closer to the other? Would they move at the same time? She didn't know. It's going to be okay, you know. I know. Because Hudson says that he's going to recover, I believe it. 
Burke was recovering new childhood memories all the time. Not that. I'm saying that your marriage will be all right. He was obviously uncomfortable, so she was touched that he was pushing himself to say these things. Thanks. She wished she had his confidence. Either he will remember loving you, or he will fall in love with you all over again. That was the most romantic thing she'd ever heard in real life, and it had come from Chase Honeywood. That's a sweet thought. She sighed. It's more than a thought. It's the truth. The bump on his head didn't change who he is. And you haven't changed. So what makes you think that you two won't figure out how to keep loving each other? That was just it, though. She thought they both had changed. They had changed since they got married. They had changed even more since he had butted a bull. But she didn't want to argue with Chase. She wanted to believe what he was saying. Olivia offered to live stream the wedding to you guys. Maybe that will help wake. Ava gasped. Oh no. What day is today? Chase held up a hand. Don't worry. She understands. Ava felt sick with guilt. I was supposed to help her. She can't cater her own wedding without help. Everyone else has gone home. She'll have help. So he was intending to stay? You can't miss Wyatt's wedding. You don't have to stay here. I hate weddings. He took a drink of his coffee. It was obviously the final word. But she knew that it was more than that. He wasn't just using Burke as an excuse to skip a wedding. He didn't want to leave Burke's side. Chase was a good brother. He always had been. Chapter 32 Burke couldn't believe how exhausted he was from just a tiny bit of therapy. Good grief. He was so tired that he wasn't exactly thrilled when Ava came back into his room, but he tried not to show it. Chase came in shortly afterward. It seemed the three of them were out of things to talk about, and the quiet was uncomfortable. Want to watch some TV? Ava raised an eyebrow. Does it have to be the rodeo channel? Why would he want to watch the rodeo channel? And then he knew what she meant. Is that what I used to do? She nodded. And what do you like to watch? Romantic comedies. Chase shifted in his chair. I'm not sure there's going to be any romantic comedies on at nine in the morning, though, she said. The remote is all yours. Just give me something to stare at, and please don't be offended if I fall asleep. I won't be, she said as if it would be impossible for him to offend her. Of course, he knew this just wasn't true. She started flipping through the channels and landed on a nature show. It took him a few seconds to realize it was about American badgers, and he couldn't help but smile. He realized Ava was studying him. What? You're smiling. Yeah, was that a bad thing? She and Chase exchanged a look that he couldn't interpret. They obviously knew something he didn't know. What? You're scared of badgers, she said. He looked at the screen. Really? Yeah, like I'm scared of mice, and Dustin is scared of snakes. You're scared of badgers. I'm pretty sure I'm scared of snakes too. She shook her head slowly, dramatically. Not like you are badgers. It's irrational. It's not irrational, he said quickly. Look at those evil little masks they wear. She looked at Chase. Oh good. He is still afraid of them. I am not. Chase narrowed his eyes. Uh. It sounds like you are. Fine. Whatever. Well nowhere near as scared as I used to be. He could explain why, but he didn't have the energy. Should I keep flipping? No, he and Chase said in unison. Burke missed his little bandit-faced friend. And Burke watched his distant relative run around the small screen until he fell asleep. There were no badgers in his dream, though. He was on horseback, but it wasn't the same horse from before. It was a new horse, a paint mare, and it was gorgeous. He was riding through the Black Hills, and he could smell vanilla again. He wore cream-colored chaps, but he had no saddle, and this made him nervous. 
They came around a bend in the trail, and he was suddenly looking up at Mount Rushmore, except that the presidents were gone, and his brothers had taken their place. Part of him felt guilty. It felt like sacrilege. Part of him couldn't wait to tell them. He nudged the horse to keep going, but it wouldn't. He tried to turn around, but the horse wouldn't move. Frustrated, he looked down and saw that there was now a saddle beneath him. A shrill cackle woke him up, and he opened his eyes to see a new face. He didn't know who she was, but he knew she was evil. He shrank back from her gaze. Oh, Burke, honey. She came at him, and he pushed himself back into the mattress as hard as he could, wondering what would happen if he tried to jump out of bed and run for the door. After how poorly he'd performed during therapy, he was pretty sure he wouldn't make it very far, yet he was still tempted to try. Who was this woman, and why was he so terrified of her? She was worse than a thousand screaming badgers. She took his hand into hers, and they felt weird. They were too soft, too fragile, too cold, and covered in powder. Maybe you're still dreaming. He tried to believe this, but it didn't loosen the terror gripping his neck. I'm so sorry this happened to you. She was baby talking. He looked down at his body to see if he had turned into a toddler. Between his weird dreams and his childhood memories coming back one at a time, anything was possible. But no, there were no toddler legs attached to his torso. He tried to subtly tug his hand out of her clutch, but she held on, some of her nails digging into his skin. Mom, Ava started. Mom? He silently screamed. This was his mother-in-law? How was he even still alive? No wonder he wrestled with bulls for fun. They weren't nearly as dangerous as this woman was. Let's go talk. Burke needs to rest. She gave him a knowing look, and though he didn't remember this dynamic, he had a pretty good handle on it. He did not like his mother-in-law, and his wife knew it. He felt a little guilty about this, but when she left the room, and the ambient temperature rose three degrees, his guilt dissolved. He exhaled and looked at Chase, who was smirking. What's wrong with her, he whispered. Chase didn't answer him. He just shook his head. Burke told him about the Rushmore dream as his heart rate eased back to normal. Chase listened with interest and then said, Yeah, maybe don't tell anyone about that one. Burke wanted to tell Chase about the other dreams he'd had, but he didn't want him to think he was nuts. What? Chase said, reading his face. So Burke started at the beginning, with the badger and the train tracks, and told him as much as he could remember, all the way up to the light at the end of the cold, damp tunnel. Pretty nuts, huh? Chase shook his head. Doesn't sound nuts to me at all. Of course not. If Chase were in a coma, of course he would dream of random animals to guide him. In Sioux culture, badgers represent war. They are stubborn and never back down from an enemy. So it makes sense why you would encounter one early on. But why the train tracks? Chase shrugged. Yeah, that one I have no idea. And I'd have to ask Holden, but I'm pretty sure the Sioux consider the turtle to be the guardian of life that they bless you with a long life, so that makes sense too. Who's Holden? Oh, sorry. He's a hand at the Bannon Ranch. And he's your friend? It was a relief to hear Chase had one. We don't talk much, but… Yeah, I guess. He's helped me with my horses while I was here. Anyway, and the horse represents strength and gives healing power, so I don't think your dreams were nuts at all. And your face carved into the mountain? What does that mean? Chase laughed. That means you're nuts. Chapter 33 I'm hungry, Ava lied. She needed to get her mother away from her husband as quickly as possible. He might not know it yet, but he was the baking soda, and Wendy Bish was the vinegar who liked to pour herself on top. Let me buy you a sandwich. Her mom linked her arm through hers, and they started down the hallway. With each step, Ava felt less anxious. You didn't have to come. Her mother gave her a withering look. I know that. Ava read between the lines, she didn't have to come, therefore, she was a hero for coming. Thank you for making the trip, Ava said without looking at her. 
She loved her mother, but that was easier when she was operating on a good night's sleep. Her mother kept her lips pinched until they were sitting in the cold cafeteria. Ava forced herself to take a bite of the sandwich, and it was every bit as bad as she'd expected. It was like chewing two slices of drywall with a soggy tomato in the middle. She'd been told there was turkey in there somewhere too, but she couldn't taste it. So what are you going to do now? It took Ava a long time to swallow, and of course she needed a long drink of water afterward, so by the time she was ready to speak, her mother was quite impatient. And then Ava exacerbated this impatience when she said, What do you mean? What do I mean? Her voice wasn't very loud, but it still sounded like a shriek. I mean that the last I knew, you were on your way to my house to move in, to finally start living your life, and now what? You're holed up in some hospital being the doting wife? Her disgust was clear. I'm not doting, mom. What would you like me to do? You know exactly what I want you to do. I've been telling you what I want you to do since you met this man. He hadn't been a man back then, but whatever. Really? You seriously want me to leave him right now, when he's in this shape? He doesn't even remember being a jerk, mom. How can I be mad at him for something that he doesn't remember? Oh, how convenient. Her mother wasn't touching her food, so Ava stopped pretending to want hers. He's about to be homeless. He's washed out. He's broke. And his wife's leaving him. And so voila. Suddenly he can't remember anything. Ava rarely got mad at her mother. She rarely agreed with her either, but usually she could at least see things from her point of view. But not this time. This time Ava got so hot so quickly that she was sure she was going to blow. Mom, you can't seriously be accusing Burke of faking a coma. Even if that were possible, Burke had never faked anything in his life. Her mother shrugged with a smug look on her face. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I'm just saying it's convenient. No, Mom, it's not. It's not convenient that I'm now unemployed too. No loss. That was a terrible job. Please don't interrupt me. Pain is never convenient. The long road of recovery ahead of him will not be convenient. Medical bills are never convenient. She was never going to tell her mother that the Bannons were covering those, and she hoped no one else would tell her either. She was a bit embarrassed to be taking charity, but her mother would turn it into a full-fledged shame parade. She forced herself to take a breath. Why are you here, Mom? I mean, I appreciate you caring, but why did you drive to Cheyenne? What did you think you could do here? I wanted to see if you were okay. I wanted to see if you were taking care of yourself, and clearly, you are not. There was more to it. Ava could feel it. And? She sighed. And, I guess I found the whole thing a tad, unbelievable. I wanted to see for myself. She swung her eyes to meet Ava's, and they bore into her. And now that I've seen it, I just don't believe it. He tried to hide it, but he recognized me. Ava laughed shrilly. Oh, for Pete's sake. No, he didn't. If he had recognized you, he would have hidden under the covers. I saw it. He shrank away from me. Of course he did, Mom. But that doesn't mean he remembers you. That means that he had the same first impression of you today that he had when he picked me up for the prom. Ava stood and picked up her trash. And what impression might that be? He thinks you're a mean shrew. She started away but then felt guilty and went back. I know that's not true, but that's the version of yourself that you've shown him. Yui never liked him, and that's not fair of you. Of course I don't like him, Ava. You are a beautiful genius. You could have done anything with your life. And what did you do? You married some fake cowboy. No career. No kids. No. I didn't want any of that, she snapped, which was true once. It wasn't true anymore, but she didn't want to go there. I just wanted Burke. She tried to think of something final to say, something to prove her point, but she couldn't, so she said it again, I just want Burke. Chapter 34 Burke held an iPad in his lap. 
Ava sat on one side of him staring at it, and Chase sat on the other. He hadn't expected their mere arrangement to be having an emotional effect on him, but it was. He felt stronger all of a sudden, like he was being flanked by soldiers. So far not much was happening on the screen. They were watching people mill about and find seats. Who is running this camera again? Burke said. The camera swung so fast that it made him seasick, and suddenly he was peering into a distorted view of Dustin's face, smiling goofily. At your service, Dustin said and then swung them back to look at the audience again. I hope he doesn't do that very often, Burke muttered so that Dustin wouldn't hear him again. Is his famous girlfriend here? Burke still couldn't believe his brother was dating some country superstar. How had that happened? And even more amazing was that they'd co-written a number one hit together. He had so much to catch up on. He didn't know how he was going to manage it. No, Ava said. She's touring. I doubt he'd be so willing to do this for us if she were there. Of course I would, Dustin said, but at least this time he didn't swing the camera. Good grief there are a lot of people there. Does Wyatt really have this many friends? I think Olivia's cooking has made him more popular, Ava said. What, she just runs around town feeding people? Burke asked. Pretty much, Ava said. Did we have this many people at our wedding? She laughed. Definitely not. He was surprised that she didn't elaborate. We did have a wedding, right? I didn't take you to Vegas or something? He was still getting to know himself again but that did sound like something he would do. You might have tried that, but your mother never would have allowed it. No, we had a wedding. It was beautiful. But it was small and cheap and quick. Why was it quick? Because we were madly in love, and my mother was threatening to ship me off somewhere to get me away from you. She giggled, but he didn't think she was kidding. The camera swung, and they were watching men walk into the barn. Wyatt came in first, followed by Seth and Hudson. They each wore a tux and cowboy hat. Just looking at them made him sweat. Why Seth and Hudson? Burke said. Why not the rest of them? Is our family cliquey? He chuckled. It was supposed to be a joke, but no one laughed. Not at all. I'm sure Wyatt would have been thrilled to have you, but he knew it wasn't really your thing, so he didn't ask you. Same thing for Chase. And I don't know why he didn't ask Dustin. Olivia only wanted to have two bridesmaids, Dustin said from behind his camera, his tone dripping with disdain. Then his voice went up an octave to say, we had to match. If we had an extra groomsman, the barn's roof was going to cave in. His pitch dropped again. And we all know Olivia has already tried to take down the roof once. What did that mean? It's okay, though, Dustin said. I got this fun job. Burke didn't know if he was using the word fun ironically, but he had a feeling that he wasn't. It sounded as if Dustin was really enjoying himself. The image turned toward the front door of the barn and dropped a little. Did he just sit down? Ava asked. Is that not allowed? Dustin asked. I guess, but where are you sitting? He was at the front of the barn, facing the audience. Unless he was part of the show, it was a pretty weird place to sit. Everyone knows what I'm doing. Everyone knows that this is Burke watching, so they gave me a special seat. He sounded delighted, as if he'd always wanted to have a special seat up front at a barn wedding. The place was full. Burke could only see a few empty chairs. Would I have been there, he asked quietly. I mean, was I planning to go? Or would he have skipped his brother's wedding for a rodeo? I don't think we discussed it, she said quietly, but yes, I think you would have been there. He found that to be quite a relief. And how long have my two brothers been hosting barn weddings? He still couldn't quite believe that was a thing. About a year, Ava said. It took them a while to get going, but it all started when Olivia drove her truck into the barn. Burke laughed. Are you serious? Even Chase chuckled. That's how they met, she said. Wyatt was spending a lot of time at the ranch because he was spending every spare second helping them renovate it, 
and then late one night she just drove into the barn. But why? Did she fall asleep at the wheel or something? Not sure, Ava admitted. Music started playing, and the last roamers found seats. Is this the first family wedding we've had there? He felt so left out, like there was this whole poetic history that he was missing out on. No, this is number two. Hudson and Evelyn got married there first. He hadn't even met Evelyn yet. Well, he probably had, but he didn't remember it. So that's who lives at this ranch? He looked at Chase. You live with Hudson and Evelyn? He hadn't meant it as an insult, but Chase flinched a little. I mostly live in the barn. This barn? Bert cried in horror. This barn had sheets of lace hanging from the beams. He didn't know Chase that well yet, but he couldn't picture him within a hundred feet of it. There's another barn in the back. It has a tack room that's sort of a small apartment. He sighed. But yes, I'm on the mortgage, so I do technically live there. Something in his voice suggested that maybe he had tired of that arrangement. The first bridesmaid appeared in the doorway. Burke couldn't make out the details on the small screen. Who is that? Olivia's cousin. I don't really know her. When the next bridesmaid stepped in, Ava narrated, that's Olivia's friend from the library. And then there was the bride. And even from this distance, it was obvious that she was beautiful. She smiled broadly all the way down the aisle, the camera swung to follow her, and landed pointing at the small stage in front where she had stopped to stand in front of Wyatt. The music stopped, and the pastor started talking. Burke zoned out a bit, trying to remember what his wedding might have been like, but he tuned back in when they said their vows, which were brief, sounded personal, and brought tears to his eyes. When Wyatt dipped his bride and kissed her like a cowboy should, Burke's chest swelled with happiness for this brother that he didn't even really know. Chapter 35 Slowly, the days went by. Slowly, Burke's thinking became clearer. At least once a day a childhood memory would surface. He would look forward to these moments like a little kid excited to go to the fair. And though these memories were from a long time ago, he started to feel like he knew his brothers. But he still didn't remember Ava. This was frustrating. Why were his memories limited to his first ten years of life? Ava did not deserve this. She was kind, and she was beautiful, and he was attracted to her, but he was not in love with her, and this made him feel so guilty. She was a stranger. Chase had finally gone home. But then two days later he came back for a short visit. Ava had acted like that was crazy that he drove that much, but Burke thought it sounded like fun. As soon as he could, he wanted to go for a long drive through the wilds of Wyoming. Maybe Ava would want to go along. The hospital added physical therapy to the occupational therapy, and both were miserable, but both got easier with each appointment, though the exercises hurt his back something fierce, and he wasn't too sure on his feet. His headache had gone from a steady companion to one of those acquaintances who only shows up when you're tired and don't feel like socializing. He was grateful for the improvement, but man when the pain returned, it was brutal. Everyone at the hospital was so kind. No one treated him like he was an idiot for headbutting a bull. And they were so good to Ava and so patient when Hudson pestered them with questions. But despite their kindness, Burke got more stir-crazy every day. He gazed out the window longingly. Ava told him that it was too hot to bear out there, that he should be grateful to be inside with air conditioning, but he wasn't convinced. He was desperate to feel the sun on his skin and actual earth beneath his feet. But he knew he wasn't ready. He still couldn't remember most of his life, and when the pain came, it was debilitating, and he wasn't sure he could be trusted to cross the street without help. So he was surprised when one morning the occupational therapist talked to him about going home. She started asking questions about their home layout. Burke looked to Ava for answers, and though he didn't remember his home, he was confused when she said that they would be living in a basement. He wanted to ask why, but he didn't want to do it in front of the therapist. So Burke let Ava and the therapist do most of the talking, thinking about what he was going to do to get his wife out of a basement. He was going to have to get a job, and soon. He was more than willing to work, but he panicked a little when he tried to think of something he could do in his current condition. 
who was going to hire him like this? Finally the therapist left, and he looked at Ava. We live in a basement? She avoided his eyes. Well we didn't used to, but we will. What does that mean? Where did we used to live? We had a house. What happened to our house? He feared the answer to this question a great deal. We were evicted. Burke hung his head in shame. I'm so sorry. It's okay. She squeezed his hand. No, it's not, he snapped. Why didn't I have a job? He was so mad at his past self, which was confusing because part of him wanted to defend his past self, but he had no idea how to. You did have a job. You were a bull rider. Did that job pay? He assumed that no, it didn't. If it did, they would have a home to go home to. Sometimes. She said it softly, without judgment. But it didn't pay well enough to stop an eviction? You thought that if you just got a few more wins, you could get us caught up on everything. Everything? We're behind on other things? We're behind on everything, but the point is, you were trying. It's not like you were being lazy. You were just being. I was just being what? She was obviously afraid to say it. Go ahead. I'm sure I deserve it. Stubborn. You can be a bit stubborn. This was easy to believe. He now knew Chase well enough to believe it ran in the blood. I'm sorry. He took a big breath. So where's this basement? Chase and Hudson's basement. Wyatt has fixed it up, I guess. It's like an apartment. It's not like we're going to be living in a dungeon. No, but we will be living on someone else's dime. Not really. I plan to pay them rent and give them money for utilities. I will get a job the second we get back. I'm a good worker, have great references, and lots of people are looking for help. He hated this with every cell of his body. He had to get better. He had to be able to provide for his wife. Whether he knew her or not, whether he loved her or not, his past self had committed to her, and he was going to honor that. I'm sorry that I wasn't a very good husband. You are a good husband. You thought that the best thing you could do for me was to be a champion, a bull riding champion. He couldn't tell whether or not she believed these words, but he didn't. Something about them didn't ring true. He was just getting to know himself, but he thought probably that chasing those belt buckles wasn't so much about providing for his wife as it was about the thrill of the chase. Chapter 36 Ava had been called out of the room to sign some discharge paperwork. She was about to step back into the room when she heard Burke's voice. She paused, thinking that he was probably talking to one of the therapists or a nurse and didn't want to interrupt. He was still sensitive about being vulnerable in front of her. But then she heard Chase grunt and knew that he was talking to his brother. She couldn't help herself. She stepped closer and held her breath. It doesn't matter whether I love her. I committed to her. So I will act like I love her. And it sounds like I've got a lot to make up for. Chase said something, but she couldn't make it out. She's earned it, right? Everyone tells me what a great wife she was. No one has told me that I was a terrible husband, but no one has said that I wasn't either. So I'm going to work to make it up to her. If it takes me the rest of my life. It doesn't matter how I feel about her or if I feel anything at all. She felt ill and fell into the wall for support. Each day at the hospital, she'd felt a little bit better about her life, but all of that encouragement had now been sucked out of her in a single moment. What was she going to do now? Her grief swiftly turned into fury. How dare he? How dare he pity her, commit to her out of duty? She was worthy of being loved. She was lovable. She had given up so much for him. And he didn't even know that he'd almost lost her. Well, maybe he was going to lose her. She was not going to stay with someone who didn't love her, who had no plans on loving her. She would get him home to his brother's ranch, and then she would leave. That had been the plan all along. She went into the waiting room to collect herself. She wasn't crying, but she was pretty sure that she was visibly upset. 
so she took a few moments, made herself take some deep breaths and think about something else, till she could go back to Burke and fake being the dutiful wife for one more day. Chapter 37 When Burke had been told that he would be living in a basement, he hadn't pictured anything like what he was looking at now. This place was fantastic. It was small, for sure, but there was plenty of room for two people, especially two people who were supposed to be husband and wife. There was a small bedroom with a queen-size bed, a large bathroom with a full-size tub, a small living room with a TV way too big for the space, and a very small kitchen with a table and two high-backed chairs. It all looked so inviting, so homey. I don't know how I'm ever going to thank you, he said to Wyatt. You might not know this yet, but you would do the same for us, bud, Wyatt said. Olivia came down the stairs carrying a tray of food. He smelled it immediately, and his stomach roared. A basset hound thumped down the stairs behind her, and Burke suspected that he was following the same smell. I thought you might be hungry, so I whipped something up. From the looks of it, she hadn't just whipped it up. Meat pies, cold sweet potato salad, and chocolate raspberry layer cake suddenly filled his kitchen table. Burke looked at the dog. What's his name? Lewis, Wyatt said, and something in his tone suggested that he wasn't a fan. Burke looked at Olivia. Is he your dog? Olivia bent to give him a vigorous head scratch. Only in the sense that he has sort of adopted all of us. But technically, he's Evelyn's dog. She looked up at Wyatt. Though Chase is the one who bought him. She shook her head. It's a confusing story. Wyatt rolled his eyes. Once again Burke felt overwhelmed by how much he was missing, but he tried not to think about it. Well, he seems to fit in well around here. Maybe even better than Burke did. Well, we'll let you get settled in, Wyatt said. Hudson will be home from work soon, and Chase is here somewhere. Ava and Burke thanked Olivia for the food and thanked Wyatt again for the housing. Again, Wyatt played it down. Don't forget that Hudson and Dustin helped fund the project. And it was all Chase's idea. This was the first time Burke had heard that part. And I'm sure Seth would have chipped in, but he's broke, Wyatt said. I'm sure that's a short-term thing. Olivia gave her new husband a stern look. Wyatt looked annoyed. I didn't say it like it was a bad thing. It was true. He hadn't. He's still young. We were all broke once. And apparently, Burke was the only one who had stayed that way, though he knew that's not what Wyatt was implying. He's broke? I thought he worked at the same place Dustin did. Maybe Seth also had an expensive rodeo habit. Yeah, but he's just a lowly grunt, Wyatt said with obvious affection in his voice. Wyatt and Olivia said their goodbyes and left. Burke looked at his wife. They were alone. The dog had gone back upstairs. This was so awkward. And it was made more awkward by the fact that Ava was acting quite squirrely. Are you hungry? He stared at the spread Olivia had left them. Not really. He didn't see how this was possible. He never saw the woman eat. I thought I would go pick up your stuff, she said. Oh, yeah, that's right. He must have owned stuff in his previous life. He hadn't thought of that. Is it in storage? Sort of. It's at my mother's. Oh. Did I pack it up, or did I make you do it? Neither. She hesitated, which made him nervous. I think you probably were going to pack it up when you got home from Cheyenne, but then, she didn't need to finish that sentence. So who packed it up? She obviously didn't want to answer him, and he got a bad feeling. She nodded. Ugh. His stomach rolled. He didn't even know what belongings he had, but he was horrified at the idea of his mother-in-law's cold hands touching all of them. I'm sorry. I was desperate. This turned most of his disgust into guilt. I'm sorry I put you in that position. Yeah, I'm going to take your truck, okay? Sure. Do you have a vehicle? She nodded. I do, but it's parked at my mother's house. Why is everything at your mother's house? He'd asked the question out of genuine curiosity. 
he hadn't known it would make her angry. Where else was I supposed to keep stuff? She turned and left, obviously in a great hurry to get out of there. He watched her go, trying to figure her out. Of course she probably wasn't comfortable moving into his brother's house. She was a grown woman. She was probably used to having her own space. The whole thing made him feel sick. No matter how good the food smelled, he had lost his appetite. He found some dishes with covers and repacked the food for the refrigerator. He would wait and eat with her later. Only once he'd made his way to the couch and turned on the television did he realize there was something odd about what she'd said. She had said his stuff. He tried to think. She'd said it more than once, hadn't she? But he didn't think she'd ever said our stuff or my stuff. So who had packed up her stuff? And where was it? Chapter 38 Ava was crying again, but she wasn't feeling sadness. She was feeling rage. At herself. She had already processed all these emotions. She had already prepared herself, heart and mind, to leave Burke, so why had she undone all that hard work at the stupid hospital? So she could grieve the loss all over again? Smart, Ava. Real smart. Just because he had bonked his head on a cow didn't mean things had changed. She chuckled bitterly. Turns out a traumatic brain injury isn't the answer to a failing marriage. She couldn't deal with her mother in this condition, so she veered off course to visit her grandmother, who lived in an assisted living facility, though she acted younger than Ava's mother did most of the time. Graham was delighted to see her and gave her a long, tight hug. I'm so sorry I couldn't come, honey. You know I wanted to but it's just too far for me now. It's okay. It had never occurred to her that her Graham would go to Cheyenne. That was crazy. There wasn't anything you could have done. I just sat around waiting for him to get better. Wendy said that you were doing okay, that she was making sure you were fed. Ava bit back the chuckle. Wendy hadn't done much of anything, but Ava wasn't going to throw her mother under the bus. If her mother wanted to make out to Graham that she was some sort of hero, then so be it. Ava had bigger things to worry about. So, why are you so glum? Is he not doing as well as people are saying? People are saying that? Of course. He's the talk of the town. Everyone's saying he's a miracle. Her stomach soured. She was going to be a villain if she left him after a miracle. You'd better tell me what's going on. Graham's thin brows were nearly in a knot. Once Ava started talking, she couldn't stop. She collapsed in a wing chair and went on and on until she was all talked out. Her grandmother listened patiently, gasping at appropriate times and giving sympathetic looks. Well, she said when Ava finally stopped talking, that is a lot. I did not realize that you were dealing with all that, and I'm so sorry. I didn't want my grandmother to know that I was leaving my husband. I know that that's not how things worked in your generation. No, things change, that's for sure. But change isn't always a bad thing, and I support you no matter what you decide. Graham, I think the decision has already been made. I just have to figure out how to break it to him. I don't want to leave him in a lurch, but I'm not a nurse either. Well, he'll be at his brother's house, right? Ava nodded. Exactly. And though Chase does work, he works at the ranch, so I would think it would be okay for me to skedaddle. I doubt Burke would even miss me. He might even be relieved. I wouldn't go that far. What happens when he does remember loving you? What are you going to do if he comes crawling back? I don't know, but I'm not going to live in a fake marriage while I wait for that moment to happen. Especially since it might never happen. Fair enough. Graham chewed her lip. You know in all of that story, you didn't really talk about loving him. So? At this point what did that have to do with anything? Do you still love him? Ava's knee-jerk reaction was just to say yes, of course she did, but she gave it some thought. She wanted to be truthful. Did she still love him? Was all that she was feeling rooted in love? Because it felt like a perfect storm in her gut. The more she thought about it, the stronger that storm grew. 
I think that I have always loved Burke Honeywood, and I think that I always will. But it sure would be nice to have someone love me back. Then may I make a suggestion? Oh no. Here it comes. Graham was going to tell her to stick it out just like they did in the old days. Of course you can. How did you get him to fall in love with you in the first place? I don't know. That felt like a century ago. We were in high school. I probably flipped my hair and wiggled my butt. Graham giggled. Ava thought she'd probably also won him over by doing his homework, but she didn't want to admit that to her grandmother. Dear, men are not complicated. He fell in love with you because you are lovable. You are beautiful and kind and smart. You were all those things, and you still are all those things. We've added experiences and wisdom, but we haven't taken anything away. So, she leaned back in her chair, looking self-satisfied. Maybe you should get to hair flipping and but wiggling. Ava uttered a shocked, single-syllable laugh. What? You won his heart once. You can win it again. I don't think I should have to, Graham. Did she not understand all that Ava had been through? All that she had put up with? All that she'd already done to win him and then stay with him? You're right. You don't have to. I'm not saying that you do. And I said that I would support you no matter what you decide. But you just said that you loved him. And there's no guarantee you'll ever find someone else to love the way you love him. Love doesn't necessarily come along whenever we want it to. So if you love this man, give it another shot. Try to charm him the way you did when you were 16. She shrugged again. Like I said, it's not complicated. Ava was dumbstruck. This was not high school. She did not have the same power as she had back then. She couldn't imagine flipping or wiggling anything these days. Oh, and I know you're not much of a cook, but he probably doesn't remember that. So maybe you should make him something good. That helps foster the old love connection as well. A lot of things change, but some things don't. Ava remained speechless. She tried to thank her Graham and say, Goodbye. But she stumbled on her words. Graham waved her off. Get back to your husband. We can visit later. I'll be waiting for an update with bated breath. Ava laughed all the way to the door. She didn't know what else to do. But as she stepped over the threshold, her Graham called after her, Remember. Flip, wiggle, flip, wiggle. Graham had been right about one thing, at least, Ava was no chef. But luckily, Burke wasn't a picky eater either. He did have a favorite meal, though, chislick and corn poppers, just like any twelve-year-old left to his own devices. She stopped on the way home and picked him up a takeout order. She knew that he had lots of food from Olivia already, so she didn't know if he'd be hungry, but she wanted to return bearing gifts because she'd been pretty cranky before she'd left. Picking up his belongings had gone more smoothly than she'd expected, but it had also taken longer. Her mom had asked her a million questions. It was almost like she suspected that Ava was thinking about giving it another shot. But Ava hadn't admitted it. The pub was busy, and it took a long time to get Burke's order ready. She grew restless and then annoyed when people kept stopping her to ask how Burke was doing. She tried to be friendly, tried to be patient, but she was right on the edge of collapsing into a puddle of full-blown breakdown when they handed her a plastic container of food, on the top of which someone had written in black marker, Welcome home, Burke. She paid, struggled to say thank you without having the breakdown, and then carried the food out to the truck. It smelled delicious. She started the truck and even though it was 70 degrees out, turned on the defrost and put the food on top of the dashboard. It was several miles back out to the ranch, and she didn't want the food to get cold. She pulled into the driveway, got out of the truck, and nervously headed up the new walkway Wyatt had made leading to their new front door. Was Burke going to be annoyed with how long it had taken her? Was he annoyed with how cranky she'd been when she left? She took a deep breath, opened the door, and went inside. He was on the couch watching TV. Sorry it took so long, she said. He scowled. How dare you apologize when you were on yet another mission for me. He patted the cushion beside him, eyeing the to-go container. I brought your favorite meal. 
she went to the couch and handed it to him. He looked up at her, one eyebrow raised. And what's my favorite meal? I guess you'll have to open it and find out, Eva said, trying to sound playful. And then as she turned to go find him some silverware, she flipped her hair. Chapter 39 It was clear to Burke that Ava expected him to really love whatever was in this takeout container, and admittedly, it did smell good. She was obviously proud of herself for bringing it back, and now she was watching him expectantly. No matter what this is, he told himself, you will love it. And if he couldn't love it, he would pretend that he did. A new fear overtook him. What if it was something truly terrible? Like Rocky Mountain oysters, or Brussels sprouts? It didn't help matters that he wasn't hungry. He'd been picking at Olivia's food all day. But Ava had tried to do something nice for him, and he would accept her gift. Whatever this was, he would make room for it. He flipped the container open and was shocked when it looked familiar. Or maybe it was the combination of smell and sight that made it familiar. He couldn't put his finger on it, but wires were connecting in his brain. It wasn't a memory, exactly. It was more like the feeling of a memory. Whatever it was, it was impossible to explain. He popped a piece of the meat into his mouth, and his taste buds exploded with excitement. His mouth filled with salty juices, and he thought this had to be the most delicious thing he'd ever tasted. Granted, he couldn't remember most of the things he'd tasted, but still. He couldn't imagine how anything could beat this. He looked at her, and she giggled in delight. This is amazing, he said slowly. I know that you think so. She looked quite pleased with herself, and she flipped her hair playfully. This was weird. He hadn't seen her do this before. It looked youthful, almost comical, and it was cute. He tried one of the corn poppers, which wasn't as good as the chislik, but it definitely took the silver medal for the best food ever. He offered her some, and she declined, acting as if she was too good for fried pub food, but he thought that this was mostly a show. He was going to have to find a way to get this woman to eat. As he chewed, that feeling of familiarity grew until it was almost like deja vu. He swallowed and tried to explain it to her, and she listened intently, though he knew she wasn't getting it. Sorry. Words are failing me. I guess I remember it on some level, but it's not like an average memory. It's like it's buried deep beneath layers of insulation. I can't quite get to the memory, but at least I know it's there. I think you're doing a fine job of explaining it. In fact, you've done a really good job of communicating throughout your recovery. Her eyes fell. She hadn't said it outright, but he inferred that he hadn't been a good communicator before the accident. Or at least not a willing one. He ate until he couldn't eat anymore, which meant he had a little leftover, which she put in the fridge for him. They watched TV in silence for a while, but he knew he was falling asleep, and he really wanted to go to bed and sleep like the dead. For the first time it occurred to him how awkward this night was about to become. There was only one bedroom. Sure, they were married, but he didn't feel like they were married. Did she still feel like they were married? Did she want to crawl into bed with a man who didn't know her? Or who had only known her for a few weeks? And how exactly was he supposed to broach that subject? Because he didn't know what to do, he did nothing. He kept watching TV even as he grew more and more tired. His eyes had just started to burn when he caught her eyelids drooping, and he felt guilty. I think it might be the middle of the night? He knew very well that it was, but he was trying for levity. I think you might be right. Maybe we should turn in. He winced. He didn't know what the right words were, but he knew those weren't them. Go ahead, she said. I'll turn the lights off. She stood up even though there was only one light to turn off. It was unclear whether she planned to join him, but he didn't know what to do, so he went into the bathroom to wash up, and when he came back out, she had stretched out on the couch. He wasn't surprised, but still, his stomach sank. He'd been right to be worried. She didn't want to sleep with a stranger. Should he just let it go? It would be so awkward to discuss this. But he didn't want to let his wife sleep on a couch, even if it was a nice new couch. He went to her. For lack of words, he cleared his throat. She looked up, 
looking every bit as uncomfortable as he felt. Look, I know this is as weird as weird can be, but you don't need to sleep on the couch. I promise to stay on my side of the bed. She giggled, making him think maybe it wasn't as awkward as he'd thought. It's not that. I just want to give you your space. I want you to get a good night's sleep. It's been a big day. You need real rest. I don't want to accidentally wake you up during the night. He glanced through the bedroom door at the bed. Isn't it a queen-sized bed? I think so, but really. I'm okay, out here. But he wasn't okay, with her out there, and he didn't know what to do about it. There wasn't much he could do. He'd failed to persuade her, and it wasn't like he could throw her over his shoulder. He lingered for a moment, giving her a chance to say something else, anything else, but she didn't, so he went to bed, and as tired as he was, his guilty conscience kept him from falling asleep right away. They were married. Weren't they? Didn't marriage still count even if he didn't remember it? He was really making a mess of this, and he didn't know how to do better. Chapter 40 Ava woke up with a crick in her neck. Despite the discomfort of sleeping on the couch, she'd managed to sleep really well. Thanks to Seth, she had spent a few of her Cheyenne nights in a nice hotel, but she hadn't got much sleep there. She couldn't stop feeling guilty long enough to relax. The bedroom door stood open, so she could see Burke still in bed. She quietly showered and got ready to go job hunting and then left him a note telling him what she was up to. She still hadn't decided whether she was going to try to make her marriage work, but her Graham's words echoed in her mind and heart. It was true that she did still love Burke, but she was so tired of being hurt. She didn't want to get her hopes up yet again. On the way into town, she realized another thing, if she went with Graham's silly plan, she wasn't entirely confident that she could succeed. Could she win his heart all over again? She didn't know. She wasn't the same confident, bouncy cheerleader she'd been in high school. Though she was still usually pretty self-assured, life had worn her down a bit. She was grateful that she had to leave the house to find a job so that she could stop thinking about her marriage for a little while. Thanks to growing up in West Hope, Ava knew a lot of people in town. Nearly everybody who had ever known her liked her. She was a good worker with a good reputation, and those who didn't know her personally knew about her husband, and most people thought it was pretty cool how Burke Honeywood had chosen to spend his life. It was time to cash in on that. She knew it would be simpler to hunt online for a job, but she planned to go to the Chamber of Commerce and do a little schmoozing. But on her way there, she passed the very small furniture factory where she'd worked years ago. She pulled into the parking lot and stared up at the place. It had been hard work, and she'd left there for a higher-paying job, but she had left on good terms. She wondered if her old manager was still there. It was worth a shot. Sure enough, he was there, and he was delighted to see her. So sorry to hear about Burke. Don't be. He's doing great. His surprise was unmistakable. Really? That's great. He paused, and his smile slid away. Are you sure you want to come back here? You left for a reason, and that was a long time ago. I'm not even forty yet. Don't treat me like I'm going to break a hip bone if I lift something heavy. And I'm not promising to stay forever, but I'll give you everything I've got while I'm here. I suppose that'll be good enough. And I wasn't calling you old. I just know it's hard work. I've never been afraid of hard work. I know that, he admitted. When can you start? I can start right now. She smiled. That had been easier than she'd expected. He chuckled. You're not dressed for it. Go home and enjoy a day with your husband. We'll see you tomorrow morning. She thanked him and left, wishing on her way out that she'd asked what the pay would be. Oh well. She was in no position to be demanding anything, and minimum wage was a whole lot better than no wage. She'd worked for minimum wage before without dying, she could do it again. She burst through her new door excited to share the news with her husband, but his excitement did not match her own. A furniture factory, he cried, horrified, as if she'd just announced that she'd joined a drug cartel. Yes, she said slowly. They make chairs. What was his problem? 
he hadn't cared last time she'd worked there. Isn't that, manual labor? Well, I won't be breaking rocks in the hot sun if that's what you're thinking, but yes, it's a factory. I don't like it. You are in no position to like it or not like it, she snapped before she could stop herself. Instantly, she felt guilty and calmed her voice down to say, it's not really up to you, Burke. I'm sorry, he said without hesitation. It's just really hard to be sitting here like an invalid while my wife is out there doing man's work. Oh boy. Was he trying to fight? She uttered a bold, throaty, fake laugh. Man's work? Are you trying to be a chauvinist right now? He stepped closer to her, and his eyes were smoldering. He reached out to her, barely touching her arm as if he didn't quite dare to grab it. I think the word you're looking for is chivalrous. His touch sent a tingle up and down her arm, but his eyes were doing the real damage. All her angst melted away under that gaze, and she wondered if she was making a mistake. She was going to get her heart broken again. My physical therapist told me that I need to take a walk every day. Okay. Was he asking her permission? Would you like to join me? His voice sounded gentler than usual. Sure. She didn't know if she wanted to, but she couldn't really say no. They went so slowly, it was almost like not moving. Morning was giving way to noon, and the sun was nearly above them, beating down on them like a punishment. Burke turned his face up to it. Doesn't that feel grand? She chuckled. If you say so. She was just grateful Wyatt had put air conditioning in Hudson's basement. Burke laughed. Have I always been like this? She had no idea what he was talking about. Like what? I know people complain about hot weather, but it feels great to me. He looked at her out of the side of his eyes. So did I used to like the heat before? She thought about it. It was weird that she didn't know. I think it depended on what you were doing. What does that mean? She thought it was pretty obvious, but she explained, if you were doing something you liked doing, then you didn't mind the heat. She didn't add that if she wanted to go shopping in Rapid, he would say it was too hot to go anywhere. That seems to be a theme with me. Wife, am I a spoiled brat? He said it so matter-of-factly that she giggled. I wouldn't go that far, and the only reason that you're hearing it as a theme is because you have talked to me so much. Please don't base your image of yourself on what I think of you. What else could I possibly base my image on? He'd stopped moving and was staring at her with wide eyes. Who you think I am is who I am. He said it so adamantly, but this was new. He certainly hadn't subscribed to such a philosophy before. She needed to tread carefully. He was a good man. She wanted him to know that, to believe it, to return to his same old confident self, even if that self had been obnoxious sometimes. Burke, I think that you're a good man. I think that you're a good man who loves to live in the moment. You love adventure. You love adrenaline. You love fun. And you worked very hard for all of these things. You aren't lazy, and you aren't a spoiled brat. But I always demand that I get my way. She shook her head quickly. Only when it came to the rodeo. You were like addicted to it or something, in love with it maybe. She gave him a chance to respond, but he didn't. He just looked sad. Yes, I guess you acted a little bratty when it came to the rodeo. But that's all. And that's not who you are. That's only part of who you are. His face relaxed in relief. I guess it's good news then that there's no more rodeo for me. He sounded sad, but not devastated. She was surprised. She thought such a revelation would have shaken him harder. Of course he'd had a few weeks to adjust to it. Maybe he'd done some of that adjusting without discussing it with her. This must be really hard on you, she said. I'm sorry if I sometimes seem impatient. This must be really hard on you too. I'm sorry that I headbutted a bull. She giggled. I suppose I can forgive you for that, since you only did it once. She said it coyly, playfully, and then. Ava flipped her hair again. She hadn't even meant to. It had just happened. It was an accidental flirt, a slip flirt, a fluke flirt. 
What next, Deva, an accidental but twitch. She silently scolded her grandmother for planting such silly ideas in her head, but when she saw the way that Burke was looking at her right that second, she cherished Graham's wisdom. Chapter 41 Wyatt and Olivia sat hand in hand on Hudson and Chase's front porch. They were watching Burke and Ava walking together. I can see the pain from here, Wyatt said. I know. He doesn't look very steady on his feet. No. And it's killing me. If there's one thing that guy has always been, it's sure-footed. He's healing, though, Olivia said. Hudson isn't worried, so you shouldn't be. I can't help it. I know. I remember when you were worried about my imaginary health crisis too. He groaned. Are you ever going to let me live that down? I haven't decided yet. And Burke's crisis isn't imaginary. I know he's getting better. I'm not blind. I can see it. But it just hurts me to watch him suffer as he heals. I know, honey. They sure do make a beautiful couple, though, don't they? They do. Now more than ever. You know that this is the happiest I've ever seen them? Olivia said. When I first met Ava, Burke was off at a rodeo, and she was checking a stack of romance books out of the library. That sounds about right. So maybe this whole cloud has a very silver lining. It does look that way, doesn't it? Doesn't mean the rain is fun, though. No. I suppose it doesn't. What were they like when they first got together? Totally obnoxious, Wyatt said. I was so jealous. What? Olivia cried in mock horror. Not of her, necessarily. Just that he was younger than me and he had a real girlfriend. And also that, and I will never admit this to anyone else, so if you repeat it, I will deny it, never mind. She laughed. Don't you dare do that. What were you going to say? She mimed zipping her lips shut. I can keep a secret. He rolled his eyes. I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, I was jealous that he was a better football player than me. But now, looking back, I think it was just because he was a little bit insane. Olivia laughed. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I played hard, but I wasn't willing to die for a football game. Burke had no such inhibitions. Wyatt chuckled quietly. He was nuts. Burke and Ava turned around and started back toward them. Wyatt jumped up, reached down, and took her hand. We should get out of here before they catch us. Catch us? Catch us doing what? He tugged her toward the door. They don't have any privacy. I don't want them to feel like they're being watched even now. Oh, okay. She let herself be led into the house, but then she grabbed her husband and spun him around to face her. It is romantic, though, isn't it? What? The way they've found each other again. The way they're falling in love with each other all over again. Yes, yes, I suppose it is. Wyatt shut the door behind her and then leaned down to kiss his wife, and it seemed he was no longer jealous of his brother Burke. Chapter 42 Burke was worried that he was either on the verge of clinical depression or already wading through it. Of course he couldn't remember if he'd ever had to deal with it before, but it sure felt new and scary. His days felt useless. Sitting around waiting for therapy appointments that felt useless when they arrived. Old memories did surface occasionally, but they were few and far between. It felt like he wasn't making much progress, and each day Ava came home from her new job exhausted. He tried to have supper ready for her, and she seemed grateful, but then she only picked at it. He would have assumed that she didn't like food at all except that on the evenings when Olivia delivered supper, Ava gobbled it right up. Was this what women felt like when they had to cook for their husbands? It wasn't a very rewarding task. Hudson had stored a bunch of stuff in the basement before Wyatt had transformed it into an apartment, and now that was all shoved into a closet. Burke had lost so much weight that his clothes didn't fit, and Hudson had told him that he had some smaller stuff packed away. So Burke started unpacking the closet so he could peruse Hudson's hand-me-downs, feeling like a complete loser. 
Before he found the totes of clothing, though, he found a box of photographs, and tugged it toward the couch, thinking that maybe some old photographs would bring back more memories. He'd figured out that sometimes memories led to one another like they were attached to one another in his brain by thin tendrils. Most of the photos looked like pictures of strangers, but some of them did bring back flashes of movement to go with them. He worked hard, going through them one by one, hoping to start a domino effect that would lead to a big revelation. He so desperately wanted to remember everything. He needed to remember Ava. So, when Ava got home from work, she found him on the couch surrounded by stacks of photos. He hurried to put them back into the box, scolding himself for not having supper started yet, but she plopped down beside him and grabbed one of the photo albums before he could slide it back into the box. What are we doing? He had moved on from his childhood to Hudson's adulthood, and there were a few pictures of him and Ava in there. He'd been staring at them, staring at her beauty, trying to remember seeing it in real life. She flipped through the photos, landing on one of him in a football uniform and her in her cheerleader getup, and tears sprang to her eyes. She looked at him. Are you in the mood for a walk down memory lane? Though she looked tired, there was a spark in her eyes. I am always in the mood for that these days. She giggled. Hang on. She went into the bedroom, and he heard rustling before she came back with a photo album tucked under each arm. They were huge. She handed him the larger one. This is our wedding album. She'd had photos of them stashed in the bedroom all this time? He'd had no idea. I thought we didn't have a big fancy wedding. We didn't, but that doesn't mean that we didn't take lots of pictures. They were pictures all right, and they stole his breath away. She looked like a princess in her white dress, and her hair looked like a golden crown. At a loss for words, he tried anyway. I have never seen anything so beautiful. She gently jabbed him with her elbow. You really have, I promise. You just don't remember. She giggled. He pulled his eyes away from her to flip the page. What is this, he asked. Our honeymoon. We went on a honeymoon? He'd assumed they hadn't bothered. He didn't see how they could have afforded it. Well, sort of. What does that mean? We went to Wyoming. She giggled. Spiky silver mountains rose up behind them in the picture, and it took his brain a minute to come up with their name, but it did. The Tetons. That's right. She sounded impressed, which was pathetic. You wanted to go to the Teton Mountains for your honeymoon? Not exactly. But what I wanted wasn't realistic. And I was just glad to go somewhere. She leaned sideways and bumped into him. Somewhere with you. Your parents knew someone in Jackson Hole, and they hooked us up with a pretty good deal. We had a lot of fun. We should do it again sometime. This raised his spirits a bit, but they immediately came crashing down when he realized how hard it would be for them to pay for a trip anywhere, even Jackson Hole. They weren't going anywhere as long as he was an invalid. Maybe we could go back to the same lodge, she said. It might jog your memory? He liked the idea, but if they waited for that trip to jog something, he was never going to remember anything. Maybe we could start with something smaller. Is there somewhere local we could go that might make me remember something? Sure. She didn't sound as excited as he wanted her to be. Maybe we could do that this weekend. His heart fell. She didn't have time to wander around town looking for memories. Maybe he could do it on his own. Chase would probably be willing to give him a ride. I'll start supper, he said. She patted his leg. No. You look comfortable. She started to get up. You've worked all day. I can do it. He knew he didn't sound eager, but he couldn't help the honesty in his tone. She looked at him. Burke, honey, stop. What you do is also work. Your body is healing. I know that's taxing. I know you're working really hard in your brain. She looked at the closet, the contents of which were strewn all over their small apartment. And obviously you've been doing some physical labor today too. I had a pretty easy day. Let me do this for you. 
She got up quickly before he could protest anymore, and then she looked down at him over her shoulder and smiled. It was a weird smile, almost mischievous. When she turned away, she flipped her hair and then he could have sworn that as she walked away, she wiggled her tushy a little. This was beyond strange. Was she flirting with him? He returned to the wedding photos, praying to remember. He focused on the photo of them dancing. We had a reception. Sort of, she called back over the sizzling on the stove. We had a little potluck meal. It was fine. Dustin was the DJ. Burke snickered. Oh, I bet he enjoyed that. He sure did. What song did we dance to? She turned away from the stove and came closer to him. It was our song. You and Me by Lifehouse. It didn't ring a bell. I played it for you over and over in the hospital before you woke up. Like probably a thousand times. She laughed. I think that Chase wanted to kill me. This struck Burke as unreasonably funny. He did not want to irritate Chase, so he didn't know why he found it so funny. You should play it now, he said. On one condition, Ava said, her voice playful again. What might that be? You have to dance with me. He looked up sharply, suddenly feeling queasy. Dance? Was she serious? I can barely make my legs work well enough to walk in a straight line. I doubt I can manage dancing. She went for her phone and was looking at the screen when she said, Don't worry. I'll lead. He hated these words. That's the thing, Ava. I don't want you to have to lead. She looked up, rolled her pretty green eyes, and flipped her hair again. Will you stop? It's just temporary. I have no desire to lead you for the rest of my life. That would be exhausting, and I would fail. Still holding the phone, she came for him, taking his hand and trying to pull him up. I really don't think I should try. Please? She was looking deep into his eyes, and it was like a spell had been cast over him. He couldn't say no. No matter how much he didn't want to do this. He rose to his feet and stepped out into the small open space beyond the coffee table. She pressed play on her phone and then set it down before laying her featherlight hands on his shoulders. He put his hands on her waist, but that did not last long because as she stepped closer to him, his hands slid naturally around her slim waist until he was practically hugging her. She was still looking into his eyes, and he couldn't stand the intensity. Something in his stomach somersaulted. This was more than just holding a pretty girl. There was something else, something extra, going on here, and he could feel it in every cell. He could feel it vibrating in the air around his body. He didn't wait for her to lead. He started dancing, and she fell into his timing. Before the first verse was over, she had laid the side of her face against his shoulder, and he couldn't believe how perfectly she fit there in his arms. I really wish I could remember loving you, he said softly before he realized he was saying it. I really wish you could too, she said, her voice matching the soft volume of his whisper. He didn't want to put her on the spot, but he asked her anyway, do you still love me? Of course I do. I've never not loved you. I was born loving you, and I'm pretty sure I'll die that way too. Chapter 43 Burke wasn't even thinking about the song. He was thinking about how good Ava's hair smelled. He was thinking about how natural she felt in his arms. He was thinking about the warmth of her arms around his neck. Lots of thoughts were running through his brain, but he wasn't thinking about the song, so it surprised him when the lyrics floated into his brain in advance. His breath caught as he waited for the recording to confirm or deny his memory. He got his confirmation, and then he knew the next lyrics and the next. I remember the song, he whispered. I know the words. She looked up at him smiling, and her eyes were wet with tears. I'm not surprised. Music does funny things to people. And I don't think it's because you played it for me when I was in the hospital. It feels like it's coming from further away than that. Well, I used to make you listen to it in your truck over and over and over again. She giggled and then reached up and gently tapped his temple. So I know it's in there somewhere. He stopped dancing and looked at her. 
I know you're tired, but take me someplace we used to go. He felt like he was on a roll, and he didn't want to slow down. Her feet stopped too. Where? He shook his head. I don't know. Was there someplace important to me? To us? He could tell she was thinking about it, and he appreciated the effort. Let's go for a drive. We'll see what we can figure out. She turned the burner off on her way by, leaving the potatoes half cooked in the pan. He followed her out to her truck and hurried to open the door for her. She looked surprised by this, which made him feel guilty. Hadn't he been the kind of man who opened doors for his wife? He shut the door behind her and went around to the passenger side. I can't wait till I can drive again. He climbed in. Have you asked lately? She started the engine. I haven't. Why? They might say yes. You're doing so much better, I wouldn't be surprised. Her confidence surprised him. Really? He certainly didn't feel like he was doing so much better. She looked at him across the cab. Of course. Everything seems to be coming more easily to you. You're speaking more quickly, you don't take as long to process, and your walking is so much less. He knew she was trying not to insult him. Goofy, he offered. She laughed. Well, that's not the word I was going to use. But you're walking better. That's what I meant. It was a compliment, but it felt weird to thank her, so he didn't. They drove in silence back into town, and she pulled up in front of a small greenhouse. She put the truck in park and looked at him expectantly. What's this? This is the house you grew up in. He looked at it, and his heart fell in disappointment. It looked like any other house. I know who lives here. I don't know them personally, but I think they're pretty nice. Do you want me to ask them if we could walk around? See if anything jogs your memory? He didn't think about that for long. No, he said firmly and then added, thank you a few seconds later. He was not going to tromp around some stranger's house. It's a little small. My mother raised six boys in that? Ava laughed. Your mother was something of a wizard. He laughed, but it hurt that he didn't remember more of her wizardry. Ava pulled back into the street and drove for a few minutes before pulling in front of another house. This one looked vacant. And this is the house we've rented for the last few years, but to be honest, you weren't here much. I'm sorry about that. I know, and you can stop apologizing. It's okay. He stared at her from across the cab. But is it okay? Have you really forgiven me? She hesitated, which made him nervous, but then there was no mistaking the sincerity in her voice when she said, absolutely. 100%. Please believe me, and then please forgive yourself. It's all behind us now. The sun was sinking, and it shined brightly through their windshield as she drove toward the edge of town. She pulled into a large parking lot with a sign that said Home of the West Hope Lions. He looked at the building, but his brain had no connection to it. She pulled behind the school, saying, they've remodeled the school. It looks nothing like it did when we were here. They got a grant from some credit card company, but anyway, the truck rolled to a stop. They were looking at a football field. This part has not changed at all. She jumped out of the truck and came around to his side. He got out tentatively. Her enthusiasm made him nervous. She obviously had expectations, and he didn't want to fail again. She took his hand and led him out onto the field. This would be more accurate, and more fun, if it were dark and I could get the lights on, but I don't have that kind of sway. She tittered. He looked down at his wife, thinking that she had more sway than anybody in the world. She motioned toward one side of the field. Picture that whole area full of red and white, screaming their heads off as if your yardage was a matter of life and death. Was I good? No, honey, you were great. He felt vaguely proud but then felt foolish for that pride. How could he be proud of something that someone else had accomplished? It's how you snagged the captain of the cheerleading squad. She bumped into him playfully. I mean, you were never going pro or anything, but you've always been a natural athlete. 
The pain in his back suggested that his athletic days were were behind him. Not ringing any bells, huh? He didn't want to say no, but he couldn't lie either. The field felt like any other football field in the world. He felt no connection to it. Let's try this. She took his hand again and walked briskly toward the end zone. As he let himself be tugged, his eyes naturally flitted toward the scoreboard, and there was a flicker of life. It was gone before he could grab hold of it, but in his mind numbers had flashed on that board. It had been lit up. And it had looked a little different. She stopped, and he realized he was in the end zone. Stay right here. She backpedaled, the breeze blowing her hair in front of her, smiling the whole way. When she reached the sideline, she put her arms in the air, and it took him a second to know what she was doing, but then she clapped her hands slowly, staccato, chanting, L-A-O-N-S. This was ridiculous, but she was adorable, and he couldn't help but laugh. But it didn't bring back any memories. She stopped cheering and put her hands on her hips. We should have brought a ball. He looked toward the end of the bleachers and gasped. He could see the bin of balls right there. They weren't there, not anymore, but he knew where they had been. Still, was it enough to tell her about? He didn't want to get her hopes up. Do you want to go, she called from the sideline. He shook his head, keeping his eyes on that phantom ball bin. Let's give it another minute. She started cheering again, and he wandered around the end zone, desperately trying to make wires connect. Hey, he called out without looking at her. Was there any particularly big play that I made here? One memory that might have soared above the rest? Absolutely. She started to tell him the details. No. Not too much. Just tell me where I was standing. Please. Chapter 44 Ava was freaking out a little. He was putting way too much pressure on himself, and this just wasn't going to work. She was trying to keep the mood light by acting playful, but she hadn't wanted to do this. She hadn't thought it was going to work, and she had been right. And now he was feeling even more discouraged. You were in the very far corner. She pointed even though he wasn't looking at her. She couldn't remember the last time she'd seen him concentrating this hard. He pivoted and headed for the northwest corner of the end zone. When he reached it, he turned and faced the 50-yard line. I caught the ball here. That's right. She tried to keep her voice light, but it was becoming a struggle. After a long pause, he asked, and then what happened? You fell out of bounds. It was weird to be the one telling the story. Before Cheyenne, he'd always been the one to tell it. She'd barely finished her words before he asked, and then what? He sounded almost frantic. He was working too hard, and he was worrying her. This was too much, too soon. Hudson was going to have a fit. She needed to tell Burke that he didn't need to remember, that they would be okay, without this. They'd been living together. They'd been getting along. So what if they weren't madly in love anymore? The spark fizzled out of most marriages, right? She didn't want to leave him anymore. It was all good. She needed to tell him this. As she tried to think of the right words to say, he repeated himself, and then what did I do? She tried to remember. You got up, looked at me, leapt into the air, and yelped. She smiled at the memory. Good grief, he had been young. They both had been. Well, I don't think that I will be able to leap, and then, jumping the tar out of her, he dove sideways and fell to the ground. She gasped. He wasn't supposed to be doing things like that. His back. He scrambled to his feet, looked at her, and shot both fists in the air, and then he froze there, looking at her, his eyes wide and wild. He looked like a statue. What was happening? And then he let out a weird choking sound and fell to his knees. She rushed to him and fell to her knees in front of him. She put her hand to his cheek and tried to tilt his face up toward hers so she could look at him. What's wrong? Are you hurt? He looked her in the eyes, and he was crying, but he was also smiling. What on earth? He was cracking up. I remember. You remember what? I remember you. 
She didn't know what to say. What do you mean? You remember me? What do you remember? He laughed through his tears and then grabbed her around the waist. They tipped over sideways and fell to the ground together. He pulled her body close to his and tucked his arm under both their heads. He kissed her on the lips for the first time in a long time, and then she knew. This was not the new Burke. This was the old Burke. This was her Burke. This was the way he'd been kissing her for years. Her whole body melted in that embrace, and when he pulled away she was breathless. I remember that feeling. I remember catching the ball. I remember looking at you. I remember the crowd behind you. But I remember that all I cared about was you. I remember that I wanted to make sure you had seen the play, and that I was so happy that you had. I remember the joy on your face, the pride, and maybe even a little bit of surprise. He laughed. I can't believe I ever forgot any of that. Stupid bull. He leaned in and kissed her again. When he pulled away this time, she couldn't help but ask, do you remember anything else? He closed his eyes. I don't, but I think that this means that the other stuff will come back too. He opened his eyes and gazed into hers. But I remember the love. I remember loving you. I still love you. So I think it's okay, if I don't remember the details, right? I was going to grow old eventually and forget times and places, right? As long as I remember you, we're okay, right? They would have been okay either way, but his words sent her heart soaring, and she pressed her lips to his with such force that he rolled over onto his back laughing through the kiss. Ava kissed her husband, and he kissed her back, and she couldn't believe how much she had missed him. Chapter 45 It was early Saturday morning, and Olivia had invited them upstairs for breakfast the night before. Ava didn't know why Olivia was cooking breakfast at Hudson's house on a Saturday morning, but she wasn't going to complain if it meant she could have some of Olivia's cooking. Wyatt, Hudson, and Evelyn were already seated at the table when they got upstairs. The basset hound lay at Evelyn's feet. He eyed them out of the corner of his eye, but he didn't pick his head up. Ava wasn't surprised. Such an endeavor would be too exhausting for Lewis. She looked around. Where is Chase? He's been invited, Olivia said, but, you know how he is. I heard that, Liv. Chase's voice floated through the window, and then he came in through the front door. He sat beside Evelyn and reached down to pat Lewis's head. Lewis picked his head up for Chase and wagged his tail. Oh I see how it is, Ava thought. Ava and Burke joined them at the table. Going to have to get a bigger table, Hudson said. He looked at Ava. Can you get me any sort of discount on a new kitchen table? At a chair factory? Probably not. But if you're ever in the market for a chair. Hudson chuckled. I was just kidding. Evelyn rolled her eyes as if to say, he always thinks he's funny. Olivia set some dishes on the table, and Ava caught Wyatt gazing at her. Good to see he was still infatuated even after they've gotten hitched. Finally, Olivia had everything the way she wanted it, and she sat down between Hudson and Wyatt. She gave Hudson a nod, and Ava suppressed a giggle. It might be Hudson and Chase's house, but it sure seemed like Olivia was in charge. Hudson said a short grace, and then everybody dug in. Once they were chewing, Olivia said, so we invited you for breakfast because we wanted to warn you. Ava stopped chewing. Oh no. Were they going to kick them out of the basement? She'd been tucking money away, but it was still a pitiful amount. Definitely not enough for first, last, and security. We have an event today, and it's going to be pretty big. Breath rushed out of Ava. Oh, was that all? The people are fairly local, Olivia said, so we don't know if some of them might know about Burke or know that he's staying here. I don't think anybody will bother you, but since he's something of a local celebrity, we thought we should warn you. Maybe you want to go somewhere for the day. But we're not kicking you out, Chase clarified. No, of course not, Olivia said quickly. We would never. Ava smiled at her use of the word we. You're also welcome to hide in the barn. 
Chase didn't look at Burke when he said this, but it was clear who he was speaking to. What's the event? Ava asked. Finally got another wedding. Good grief, I hope the groom is wearing shorts, Ava said. It was already fixing to be a scorcher. I doubt it, but Wyatt put some air conditioners in the barn. Not exactly energy efficient, Wyatt said, but if people are going to insist on getting married during the dog days of summer, I guess we can make sure they don't drop dead of heat stroke in the middle of saying their vows. Good for them, Ava thought. When it was time to commit, it was time. It didn't make sense to delay their happiness while they waited for cooler weather. Ava looked at Burke. What do you think? Do you want to get away for the day? Burke scowled. They're not going to come into the basement, are they? No, Olivia said quickly. But I think we all know that people are weird, and I just worry that one of them might be peeking in the windows or something. You're right, Burke said. That would be downright creepy. Well, Ava has to work, so I think I'll just hide in the basement. He glanced at Chase. But thanks for the offer of your barn. If they start trying to take pictures through my windows, I might join you. Ava knew it had been a joke, but Chase's expression suggested it wasn't beyond the realm of possibilities. Anytime. That's where I'll be. The family fell silent, and Ava ate quickly because she had to get going. Olivia noticed. I didn't even know the factory ran on Saturdays. Ava nodded. Only when they fall behind, but I'm grateful for the extra shifts. Beside her, Burke shifted in his chair, and she wished that she hadn't said that. It's not forever. Trying to work hard right now so I don't have to work so hard tomorrow. Olivia nodded. Understood. Ava and Burke finished eating, thanked their hosts, and went back downstairs. Burke gave her a long kiss, goodbye, and then said, have a great day, honey. If I'm not here when you get back, come check the barn. He chuckled. I'll find you. Don't you worry about that. I love you. I love you too. And she could hear that he meant it. So there was a bounce in her step as she walked to her truck. Hard work felt a lot less hard when she was in love. Chapter 46 Burke barely made it back to the ranch before Ava got home from work. There were so many cars parked on either side of the road, he wasn't sure he was going to make it at all, but with a little off-roading, he managed. He was still out of breath, though, when she came to the door, and he tried to hide that fact. He got up to greet her and noticed her glancing at the stove. She was hungry. Good. I didn't make supper because I want to take you out on a date. She sighed. That's a nice thought, but… He knew exactly what she was going to say and didn't let her. A cheap date, he interrupted. He took her hand. Come on, let's go. He wasn't going to take no for an answer. No as she pulled back. I need to take a shower first. He was antsy, excited, but he conceded. Okay, but make it quick. She gave him a dramatic dirty look. I'll shower for as long as I want to, Buster. He heard the water start running and then he heard her romance audiobook start playing. He rolled his eyes. He didn't understand why she always had to have something to listen to while she showered. Was showering really that boring? But when she came out of the bedroom, she was completely dazzling, and he was smitten once again. He held her hand on the way to the truck. Most of the wedding guests had left the property, and many of those who remained stared at them as they went by, but nobody got too weird. It kind of stinks that I'm more of a star now than I was before I got hurt. She didn't say anything, and he wasn't surprised. She still didn't love talking about the rodeo. They drove to the diner in town. Not exactly a romantic spot, but it was the best he could afford under the circumstances. The place was busy, and they would have to wait a few minutes for a table. No problem. He needed to use the restroom anyway. On his way back to the waiting area, he saw her talking to a woman he didn't recognize. When he got close, he overheard the stranger say, so I guess you're not going to leave him now. He stopped in his tracks Ava saw him over her friend's shoulder and must have read his expression because she promptly dismissed the friend, and came toward him. 
Don't listen to that. She shook her head. It wasn't like that. But her eyes told him there was something to it. Then what was it like? He tried to keep his voice even, try not to panic. I'll tell you everything, she said. But let's wait till we sit down. It's not a big deal. He was grateful that they got a table soon after that because the not knowing was making him queasy. He didn't even open the menu. As soon as the waitress walked away, he looked his wife in the eye and said, You were going to leave me? She surprised him with a nod. Yes, I was. But that is so far behind us. Please don't even think about it. How could he not think about it? Had she lost her mind? Tell me why. What would make her leave him? And then a horrifying thought popped into his head. Did I cheat on you? He couldn't imagine that he would do that, but that would certainly explain the leaving. She shook her head quickly. Only if you consider the rodeo to be a mistress. Look, we were being evicted. I was being ignored. Ignored, Burke. I was frustrated. I said to you, if you go to this rodeo, if you go to Cheyenne, then I won't be here when you get back. And you went anyway. Her voice cracked on the last word, and his heart broke. He opened his mouth to apologize, but she didn't give him a chance. But it's all good now. I love you. I am not going anywhere. And I don't want to lose you. Can we just pretend that you never heard those words? She took a quick breath. I really wish that you hadn't. No. No. She sounded scared, so he hurried to say. No. I want to remember. I don't want to pretend anything. Okay, so you were going to leave me because I chose the rodeo over you. Let's try to heal that wound, not pretend it never happened. She nodded. When did you get so wise? He didn't feel wise. Where were you going to go? I didn't really have a plan. I was just going to go to my mother's. He groaned audibly. Oh, it really was that bad. And that explains why everything was at her house. He sighed. I am so sorry, Ava. I know that, and I've forgiven you, so can we please just get back to our date? I am so sick of crying. He nodded. Sure. He reached for the menu. But I really wanted this to be a romantic evening, and I feel like the mood has been spoiled. She reached across the table and touched his hand. Nothing has been spoiled. Seriously, of all the things that you can't remember, can't you just forget what she just said? He laughed. Fine. He scanned the menu for the cheapest form of beef. After they had eaten, he asked her if she wanted to share a dessert. Predictably, she said no, so he ordered one anyway, in hopes that she would at least take a bite. His hopes were granted, and they shared a small slice of cheesecake with strawberries on top. Good. He wanted this moment to be as sweet as possible. When she was just about finished, but she still had strawberries in her mouth, he reached into his pocket. He knew this was going to hurt, but he was going to do it anyway. He stood up, and she looked up in surprise. What's wrong? He went to her side of the table and knelt beside the booth before opening the box in front of him. She giggled and her hands flew to her mouth. Burke. What are you doing? We're already married. I am humbly asking you to keep being my wife. She laughed. And you were planning this before that unfortunate incident at the door? He nodded. Yes, and now I'm glad that I had the foresight. It seems my timing is impeccable. She laughed harder as she bent toward him, put her hands on either side of his face, and kissed him. He could taste the strawberries on her lips. When she pulled away, the people around them cheered, and Burke felt his face get hot. Okay, time for me to get up off my knee. Can you? For your information, I have been working my butt off in physical therapy. Despite his tough talk, he did grunt a little as he got up. I know you have. I'm only teasing. She took the box from his hands, and he tried not to let the lumbar pain show on his face as he slid back into his side of the booth. She gazed down at the ring. 
Where am I supposed to wear this? I already have a diamond. Wherever you want, my love. She slid the diamond on top of her other two rings and tilted her head before looking at him. She lowered her voice to ask, Burke, how did you ever afford this? I sold my buckles. The smile slid off her face. You what? She sounded horrified. He reached across the table quickly and grabbed her hands. It's okay. I promise. She shook her head. What if the memories come back to you? What if that meaning comes back to you? You're going to be sorry that you did that when you remember how much you love those buckles. I don't want you to resent me then. He cut her off. I already remember how much I love those buckles. I am remembering lots of things, Ava. Too many small things to tell you them all. I've been watching rodeo footage, and I remember lots of moments, and yes, I did love the rodeo. I still do. And I'm remembering some of what I sacrificed to get those buckles, and well, it only seemed appropriate that I sacrificed the buckles to get that ring for you. She stared at him, her mouth hanging open. The rodeo is my past. You are my past, my present, and my future. If you want to be. I want to be your husband. 100% this time. And I want you to be my wife. So, what do you say? Will you keep being my wife? She came around the table, slid into his side of the booth, and kissed him again. And he took that as a yes. Epilogue. Burke reclined on the end of the couch and looked up at the television. He'd been grateful to his brothers for the use of their basement, but it sure was good to finally be in his own home. Just in time too, he thought as he watched Ava walk into the living room. She looked more beautiful than ever with the small bump in her belly. How was work? Ava sat down beside him. It was definitely work. He chuckled. His back was killing him. Well, you don't have to do it forever. No, no, I like it. And it was true. He liked it even more than he thought he would. It was cool to be working with cattle for real instead of for show. And the guys are being nice to you. Liam wouldn't let them be anything else. Liam Bannon was the foreman at the Bannon Ranch, and he ran a tight ship. Burke liked him a lot, liked working for him. Good. How about you? Good. It was a good day. Good. She'd been promoted to manager at the factory, and he couldn't be prouder of her. Her new gig had come with quite a pay raise. He'd had to work through some stuff knowing that she earned more money than him, but he'd managed it. He was just grateful that they were both doing honest work that paid whether they won or lost, and that they were finally getting caught up on their finances. She put her feet up on the coffee table her mother had gifted them. It was ostentatious, and he hated it. What are we watching, she asked. Everybody loves Raymond. Not everybody, she quipped. He drives me nuts. Burke already knew this, so he didn't comment. It was the episode where Ray and Deborah fight over the suitcase, and he now knew that it was one of his favorites. But that long-standing fondness did not explain why, when Raymond tried to pull the suitcase up the stairs by grabbing Deborah's feet, Burke recalled another memory. It hit him so hard that he felt dizzy. Dizzy and deeply, deeply embarrassed. He looked at Ava, his first thought being the foolish hope that she didn't remember. But of course she remembered. She hadn't head-butted a bull. She caught him staring at her. What's wrong? This is your favorite part. I just remembered another memory. His skin grew cold. What had he been thinking? Sure he'd been young, but still, youth was no excuse for that. Oh really? It's been a while. I thought maybe you'd maxed out. He shook his head slowly. Honey, I'm so, so sorry. Looking intrigued, she laughed. What is it? He swallowed hard. I remember the first proposal. She tipped her head back and laughed so hard she shook the couch. Oh, that, she finally said, wiping her eyes. She slid closer to him and took his hand. And do you remember what I said to that first proposal? Well? 
I assume you said yes, since we got married. He remembered their wedding now. He knew they were really married. Really? You don't remember that part yet? He concentrated, but no, he couldn't remember her part of the story. Only his own. How he'd told them in advance to put the camera on him. How he'd dismounted after eight seconds, thrown his hat into the air, ran to the side of the arena, and gone down on one knee, right in front of the entire range day's rodeo crowd. Eighteen and cocky. It was his only excuse. Honey, I know it seems crazy now, but I loved that proposal. I ran right down there and jumped into your arms. Security had to shoo us out of the ring, remember? He didn't, and he wondered if she was exaggerating to make him feel better, but that wasn't like her. Still, I propose to you at a rodeo. I can't even believe it. Believe it. It made perfect sense at the time. It even makes sense now. Rodeo was our whole life. We were young then, remember? It was a struggle, but he did remember. And while it had been fun to be young, he was glad he wasn't young anymore. He was glad for the small amount of wisdom he'd acquired. He was glad for calm, beautiful, predictable days with a beautiful, kind, smart woman who loved him. He wouldn't trade the life he had now for all the thrills in the world. I sure do love you, Ava Honeywood. I love you too, husband. Thanks for being my real-life romance novel come true.